Okay, three, two, one. Hello, world. Uh, good morning at my time. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night to everybody else in different time zones. I hope you're well. I am. I've not been really, really well. In fact, if you see my past stream, I was probably too serious, but because I felt a little bit sick, I banged my head uh, somewhere, and uh, it was really. Uh, it made me dizzy for a, a couple of days, maybe even more. Hi, Angelo. Good morning. Good morning to you. So let's get immediately to business. I'm going to the coding section, uh, coding scene. How's it called? And today is the 16th of January 2021 at 10 a.m. my time, 9 a.m. UTC. Hi, PNTM. Good morning. Or probably good afternoon f to you you're from indonesia right um so last time we had last wednesday we had a practice session um this practice session was about all the topics that we covered last saturday so what are the topics that we covered last saturday we had um a rough and a quick uh, run through some of the JavaScript fundamentals. We haven't covered them all yet because they are a lot. This is the most important part of the whole course. So JavaScript fundamentals, we saw how to create a hello world uh, web application with just an alert that outputs hello world. Uh, we mentioned the modern mode, but we don't really care about this. We talked a lot about variables and we did some exercises on variables and constants. As you can see, these on top are variables, uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> are constants. And these are the, this one at the bottom is actually a variable because its value can vary. So the color orange will always be orange, but this color in particular starts being orange and maybe one day it becomes some other color, maybe color green or color blue, color red. Okay, so constants and variables. These are really, really important. Um, I already mentioned it, but in my daily work, I usually prefer using constants instead of variables, which kind of looks strange, but um, I'm really fond of uh, functional programming. And one of the principles in functional programming is that you do, should never mutate state. If you want to mutate state, you just create a copy of that state and you mutate that copy instead of mutating the original state. Um, hey, Sal, good morning. Good morning to you. But for now, since we are learning a programming language, which is JavaScript in this case, but uh, any programming language has variables and we have to understand what variables are about, how they work. And maybe one day, if you are fond like me about functional programming, you will avoid variables as much as you can and you will rely on constants. Or if you're a fan of other programming paradigms, such as object-oriented programming, which is the main programming paradigm in Java, C Sharp, C++, C++ not C, uh, then you will heavily rely on variables instead of constants. Um, code structure, we already saw what is a statement. A statement is just uh, one line of code that executes something. Uh, you can put multiple statements in the same line, but you have to separate them with a semicolon. And usually it's not a good idea to put multiple statements in the same line. So let's put one statement for each line or one line for each statement. Um, semicolons are actually optional in JavaScript. I don't use them, but during this course, I will try as much as I can to use semicolons. Because other programming languages use semicolons, such as Java and C Sharp, and I want you guys not to be spoiled in the wrong way. I want to spoil you in the, in the proper way. Uh, and then we can also add comments. There are three kinds of comments in JavaScript. One is the slash slash comment, which is a line comment. And then we have this comment that you see here, which is slash asterisk opening and closes with a slash uh, asterisk slash which is really, really similar to the comments that you already know from CSS. There's also another kind of comment which starts with slash double asterisk. And uh, it's exactly the same thing, but uh, sometimes it just looks better because it allows you to... Let me show you again one more time. 
uh, it allows you to go on a new line and it will automatically add this uh, extra asterisk and uh, extra spaces so every single line is well indented look at how cool this comment is well this kind of comment is also used to generate automatically documentation from your code but this is already an advanced concept and i never you do it so i don't know if this is really really that important right now so who cares we've got three types of comments we're going to use mostly the first two so slash slash or the slash asterisk asterisk slash um, we started looking at data types and we know that there are not many data types in JavaScript, luckily. There are much many more uh, data types in other languages. Here we've got the usual data types, which are number, uh, which is for integers, but also for floating points, so for numbers with decimals. Uh, three is a number, is a magic number, and uh, pi is also a number, uh, the number pi. Um, then we've got the boolean type, which is another important uh, data type in every programming language, which can be just either true or false. And um, some languages make r no real difference between true and one and zero and false. So true means one and one means true and zero means false and false means zero in certain languages. In uh, JavaScript, it's slightly more complicated and we're going to see it today. Uh, we've got the string type, which is really, really important because it allows you to create any kind of text. And of course, right now, everything that we see, if it's not pictures, it's text. And if in, even if we need some screen, um, screen reader, well, the screen reader must read text, cannot read uh, pictures. So text is really important. And text is represented in any programming language with a string, a string of text. And strings in JavaScript can be created in three different ways, with the single quotes, with the double quotes, and with the backticks. The backticks are uh, create something that is more of a string. It's called a template string or a template literal, which allows you to have multi-line strings, to interpolate variables and uh, JavaScript expressions inside of the script uh, of the string, and allow you to uh, use both single and double quotes without escaping. So really, really cool addition. Um, in, uh, in the JavaScript language. The backticks were not available for a long time and they were added just recently. Um, I think in 2016, 2017. Uh, the type symbol, I don't care about it. Uh, I'm not going to explain it and I never use it in my life. And it's uh, something that, as far as I know, only uh, exists in JavaScript. It's a new edition and it is used by some library developers, but for us common developers that just create applications, games, uh, mobile apps or whatever, we usually don't really care about symbols. And then we've got other uh, kinds of um, types that we're going to see later on. We have objects, for example, the math object, which makes strange things in JavaScript because we also got the null value, which if you ask for its type, it says that it's an object, which is strange because null means nothing and nothing is not an object. It's exactly the lack of anything. It's the lack of objects or any other types. And in JavaScript, we also have another type, which is the topmost one here, which is the undefined, which doesn't seem that different from the null value. Well, undefined and null can be used interchangeably. Um, it's up to you how you want to use them or it's up to the library that you are using uh, to, to, to understand how you want to um, interpret these values. I usually interpret these values as null means no value, undefined means I don't know the value and that's it. And then we've got another type uh, which is a function and we're going to talk about functions probably even today. Alert, the usual function that we are using to open a pop-up with a message, but also confirm and prompt are functions. And if you don't believe me, then just not open the terminal. Alert is available only on the browser. So I'm going to open a new browser window, whichever, and I'm going to say, what is the type of alert? 
It is a function. What is the type of uh, confirm? It is a function. What is the type of prompt? It is a function, okay? So all three interaction uh, means that we saw last Saturday are functions. And what is a function? We will see later, don't worry. So these are about data types. Interaction, we saw alert, prompt, and confirm. Today we're going to look at type conversions, but before this, I'm going to spoil the exercise I gave you last Wednesday. Last Wednesday we did some practice. Um, I don't know if um, any of you was there. I'm pretty sure that Bobby was there with his baby on his lap. And um, we, during this practice, we, started re we, we restarted reading all the material uh, line by line, very carefully, and we also jumped to the end of each page and did the tasks. Uh, we did the tasks about the hello world, we did tasks about the variables, data types, and interaction. And I think at the end of... Um, nope. Yeah, at the end of the, of the lesson, of the practice session, I left you with this... Uh, comment, which is the, 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 the doc comment that I showed you uh, right before. Uh, I said, the online shop asks the user for the price and quantity of two items and outputs the amount of the total sale. Well, pretty obscure. And this is an exercise. This is uh, a, a problem that I'm giving to you and you have to provide a solution. A solution, of course, with uh, JavaScript. So, what, how do we, oh, <laughs> I'm receiving, as always, um, comments on my YouTube channel by bots. And this is uh, always uh, very fun for me. If you have a look at my videos, you probably see comments by some bots that say, so nice, banana, 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 or so nice, hearts, hearts, hearts. You can get more info about me on my channel. Anyone want to be my boyfriend? So I'm really glad that my videos on YouTube allow these lonely bots to, you know, these lonely hearts to, <laughs> to send their messages to the world. Anyway, um, so this is a problem that we have to solve with JavaScript. And I'm really glad to say that Bobby solved this problem uh, so thanks bobby for your commitment you watched all the whole stream uh, last wednesday with uh, in live with me and uh, you even did your your homework so and you also was uh, you also were so um, kind to not share the solution to everybody you just shared it privately with me so you didn't spoil the solution uh, with everybody so thanks a lot and now I'm going to do the exercise right now with you uh, unless you say no no please I want to try it myself because I didn't see this uh, this homework uh, but it's fine I can still go pretty slow I don't want to go too fast with these concepts because these are very important and they are really difficult to, of course, to, uh, to internalize uh, at first. So let's keep it slow. There's no rush, really no rush. We're going to stay quite a while with this uh, slide number 10. So uh, the online shop asks the user for the price and quantity of two items and output the amount of the total sale. Maybe this obscure sentence is already too big and I cannot wrap my head around it. What does it want from me? What should I do? So one thing that we can do is to try and split this problem into multiple sub problems. So we can fix those problems one by one, step by step, we will come up with a solution. We don't need to go on with the, with the whole solution immediately. In fact, this is a common error that even experienced developers do. They, uh, they look at a problem and they try to fix it right away. Instead, even for uh, simpler uh, problems, you can just pause, think, and try to solve independently any sub-problems that you are able to, uh, to split from the whole overall problem. So, online shop. Ask the user for the price and quantity of two items. So, first of all, we've got two items. And for each item, we want to see the price, uh, we want to get the price and the quantity. So, I would say 
uh, get price and quantity from user for these two items and then outputs the amount of the total sale so it must calculate this total sale uh, how do you calculate the total sale uh, probably it is get uh, the quantity of items get the price of the items uh, for, for each item sum them up and you should have the total sale but let's see later um, and then after calculating the total sale I'm going to output it and uh, well okay output it okay so we've got two items for each item get the price and quantity from user maybe this is not really that clear for each item get price and quantity from user um, calculate the total sale and output it okay so now we already start uh, dividing the problem into multiple subproblems. So for each item, get price, price and quantity from user. Um, let's try and split this even more. If I have one item only, I have to say get the quantity. I'm gonna uh, indent it a little more just to say that this is a, a, a sub, um, a, it's a der der derivation of the first one. So get the quantity, uh, get the price. Maybe I said the, get the price before. So get price. So get price, get quantity, and now you've got all you need for the item. And then you have to do the same for both items. Um, how do you get the price? Well, you get the price with a prompt. This is the prompt function that allows you to get input from the user. How do you get the quantity? Same, you use prompt as a function to get the input from the user. Um, that's it. Now calculate the total sale. How do you calculate the total sale? Well, if you've got these two prices and these two quantities, probably the thing that you have to do is to do price of the first item times the quantity of the first item plus the price of the second item times the quantity of the second item. Well, what I wrote here it was supposed to be pseudocode, so not real code. But in JavaScript, this pseudocode is actually JavaScript code. This is exa exactly what we are going to write because this is valid JavaScript code. And then output it. How do I output this um, some results? I use alert. Or alternatively, if you want, you can use console log. Okay, these are the two functions that I told you about. Do we need anything else? Uh, probably not. Here I'm assuming that the, the, there are four variables called price one, quantity one, price two, quantity two. Um, but yeah, probably we understood this from, uh, from before. Uh, get the price one, prompt. Get quantity one, prompt. Then I have to do exactly the same. I have to get the price two with a prompt and get quantity two with a prompt. This is the only way for now that I know how to get information from the user and store it in a variable so I can use this variable to, uh, to, to perform some calculations. So now I wrote a lot of things and I'm going to solve the problem. Uh, everything good so far? Everything clear? Is it too trivial even? You can tell me. Let's see what the audience has to say. The audience is quite silent for now. Okay, 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 okay. So let's just go. Okay, so first of all, I want to get the price and the quantity of the first item. You know what? I'm going to also add a comment here. And I'm going to say, uh, get price and quantity for first item. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I see the replies. Maybe there is a, a little bit of delay. No, I think it's good. It's fine. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, get price and quantity for first item. How do I do this? Well, I declare a variable, let price, and I declare a variable called quantity, let quantity. Then I want to assign a value to these variables. And I'm going to say that price is the result of using the function called prompt. I'm invoking this function prompt. 
Um, and prompt usually allows me to add a message on the pop-up that tells me what to ask to the user. So the prompt will say, I don't know, give me the first item's price. What did I do wrong? If you see the colors in the editor, I'm trying to use the uh, single quote character as an apostrophe, but I'm using a string that is created with single quotes. So there's this problem here about using single quotes inside of a single quote strings. Uh, just wait a second because I think I have a format on save still on. Every time I work, I, I, I change this. So how do I create a valid string with single quotes inside? As always, I have to either escape this special character, and that's fine. Or I can use the double quote. Or in general, I can even use the back ticks, but uh, I don't think it's uh, really that needed right now because back ticks are usually used just for uh, multi-line and for interpolation of like, JavaScript expressions, and it's not our case here. Prompt al also um, allows to specify a default value. And uh, we don't need a default value, but if we want, we can say that if the user doesn't uh, write anything, it will just say zero. Uh, it should actually be a string because prompt creates a text input and whatever you type inside will be text, will be a string. But uh, you know that uh, JavaScript is a weakly typed language. And by weakly typed, I don't mean that you type JavaScript every week. It's weakly, weakly typed. So you're not typing JavaScript every week. It's that the typing system in JavaScript is weak, uh, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually an awesome thing if you know how to handle it. Uh, weakly typed languages uh, allow you to mix together apple and apples and oranges and try to make sense of what you're saying. So it's an extra help. In fact, if I put a zero here, a number as a default value, well, JavaScript will be so cool to say, yeah, it's a number, I expected a string, you know what, I'm going to convert this number automatically to a string. And that's it, I don't need to do it by myself. Uh, the problem with weakly typed systems is that sometimes things happen under the hood and look like magic. You input a number and it came out a string. Why is that? You have to understand why it happened. Uh, but as soon as you study thoroughly the language as we are doing, uh, there's no problem with that, right? So price is the result of prompting. Give me the first item's price. And by default, it will just give you zero. Uh, if you open the prompt right now, it will show a text input with a zero inside. Don't believe me? Let's find out. How do I... Uh, experiment with this file. I cannot do this on the terminal. Why can I not do this on the terminal? Let's uh, say it again. If I go to my Inglorious Academy portfolio, what was that? Inglorious Portfolio. And then here we've got a lot of uh, stuff to go to. JS Fundamentals. It was with uh, zero one practice. And that's the shop. So if I do node shop JS, it's, uh, it says prompt is not defined. Why is it not defined? Because prompt is a function that is only available in a web browser because only web browsers allow you to create a, a graphical pop-up. Uh, the terminal is not, a, is not able to create anything graphical uh, if you just don't uh, type anything else. Um, Angela says, doesn't the variable have to be named price1? Because we're going to create another variable price2, I assume. And you're completely right. Yes, I was doing it uh, uh, step by step, but you're completely right. Yes, we are taking the price and the quantity from the first item. So at a certain point, when we have to uh, get the price and the quantity from the second item, we could be tempted to say, let price is equal to another thing and let quantity is equal to another thing. But now the two names clash with the other two names. So yes, we have to uh, define these variables in a specific way, like price one, quantity one. 
and uh, you're completely right. Or maybe we can say price of first item, if you want to be more explicit. Um, I don't think it's a good idea right now to create these long and verbose variables. Uh, I think that right now the, the code is already complicated enough, so we can just go with price one, and you're, you're, you're right. So, okay, let's go with price one instead of just price. You're completely right. So, let's not use the terminal in order to, to do this exercise, because we need to prompt an alert, and prompts and alerts are only available on the browser. Uh, I can place this script inside of an HTML page, and then use the live server to use the HTML page. But you know what? I'm just going to open a developer tools panel inside of a new tab, whatever the new tab is. This is a JavaScript environment, which contains alert. In fact, type of alert is function. Whereas on the terminal, on the terminal, if I node here and I'd say type of alert, it says undefined, okay? So the terminal doesn't know anything about alert. It's undefined. I don't know what this is, says the terminal, but the browser said, yes, alert, I know it. It's a function. And here I can just paste whatever code I wrote so far. So let price is or let price one, let quantity one, and this is how we declare variables. And then I assign a value to price one. Price one is equal to prompt, give me the first item's price, and by default it will use zero as a value. I press enter, and I see that the, the page actually says, uh, the name of the page is pretty strange, but don't worry about that. Give me the first item's price. By default, it's zero. But I want to say that it's uh, five. And if I say OK, then price, as you can see, is a five in double quotes. So actually, if I inspect price, it's a string. It's not a number. But probably I don't need to care too much about it. Let's just continue uh, for now. But for now, we know how to use the prompt function in order to get input from the user. So price one is prompt of give me the first item price. And then I can say quantity one is equal to prompt. And I'm going to do the same thing. Now I understood that it's much better to use a double quote uh, here if I ever need um, a single quote for an apostrophe. Give me the first items quantity. And by default, it's still zero. Now we have price one and quantity one. It should work exactly the same, but you know what? Let's try. If I now copy all of this, it kind of works. Give me the first item price, five. Give me the first item's quantity, let's say three. Okay, so it just gives me three, but I'm pretty sure that if I say price one, it says five, and quantity one will give me the string three, not the number three, the string containing uh, a digit, a character, which is three. Okay, so we've got, we solved the first part of the problem. Now we have to do exactly the same for the other two. And uh, I'm not going to do a copy and paste because I hate copying and pasting and I discourage you to use copy and paste. In fact, copy and paste is really, really dangerous. You could uh, copy everything here, you could uh, change the, 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 the names of the variables and then maybe forget to change the name of this variable here. So you copy, you change things, maybe you don't change everything and your code is crap and is really, really difficult to debug where the bug is. So don't copy and paste if you can or limit yourself as much as you can with copy and paste, I'm going to write everything from scratch. Um, also, because this way I can give you some more information on uh, how JavaScript works. Um, so I'm gonna create a new comment here, get price and quantity for second item, because this is what I'm going to do now. And here, I'm going to write exactly the same thing as before, but, I'm also saying that, I'm also showing you again, that you can declare a variable and assign a value on the same line. So I can say let price two is equal to prompt, 
and then the string. Give me the, the, the second item's price. By default, still zero. Okay, so I can do the same the, 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 the declaration and assignment on the same line, which is actually what I usually do. If I already know the value that I want to, the initial value that I want to assign to the variable, I usually put everything in one single statement instead of splitting into two statements. So let quantity two is equal to prompt, not print, prompt. And here, give me the second item's quantity. And that's it. And now this thing here, we already covered it. Uh, I think that uh, it is pretty s n not really that important to try it, but uh, you know what? Uh, the scientific method is about doing experiments, changing one variable at a time and see if everything works. If I change too many variables and something doesn't work, I don't know where I made a mistake. So uh, what I encourage you to do right now that you are beginners, but also later on, I do it all the time, uh, just add one line of code, change one variable, change something and do the test. And then you change something else and do the test. If you do one, two, three, four, five changes at the same time and then do the test and something, ha some something wrong happens and you see a bug, then it will be much more difficult to identify where the bug was originated. Was it on uh, line number one, line number two, line number three? Who knows? But if you test every single thing that you write, instead, this will be... Um, this will make you immediately understand where you, you got it wrong. So, get price and quantity for first item, get price and quantity for second item. I just copied and paste here in the console. Just gonna press enter. So, give me the first item price, three. Give me the first item quantity, four. Give me the second item price, two. Give me the second item's quantity, another three. Okay. It gives me four here for a sp some reason that I'm not telling you. But now if I inspect the value of every variable, price one is three, uh, price two is two, quantity one is four, quantity two is three. Okay, so all the values that I got from the user are now stored inside of those variables. Cool. So last step, well, all, uh, second to last step, I have to calculate the total sale. And you know what? I'm going to add a comment here just to remember what I'm trying to do. Calculate the total sale. Okay? As you can see, I'm using the imperative mode for these, uh, uh, for these comments. I'm asking the computer nicely, hey, please computer, get the price and quantity for a first item, get the price and quantity for a second item, then now calculate the total sale and finally output the total or something like that. Um, I can say this line calculates the total sale or uh, I'm calculating the total sale, that's fine. Uh, but I usually prefer to use the imperative here. Um, so how do I calculate the total sale? I need a variable. Um, and this variable will store this calculation here, which is price times quantity plus price times quantity for both items. So let's, let's say total is equal to price one times quantity one. This is exactly as, the same as the pseudocode that I wrote before, plus price two times quantity two. Someone of you was uh, worried that there was a lot of maths involved in programming. As you can see, we're trying to limit the maths at the minimum, but at least sums and multiplications, we have to do them. Otherwise, there's no need for a computer. So here's the, how we calculate the total sale. And uh, if this uh, calculation was correct, I just need to show it to the user. How do I show it to the user? I'm going to create a comment here. Uh, show the results to the user, something like that. And here I'm going to write the line that shows the result to the user. But since I already told you it's better to every time change something and inspect, I'm going to copy everything again. I'm going to paste it again and see what happens 
to the total when I input the numbers. So three, five, two, four. What is the total? The total is 23. And I think it's good because three times five plus two times four means 15 plus eight, which is 23. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it should work. So how do I show the result to the user? I don't want to show the result in the console because the user is not like us. It's not a developer and doesn't know how to open the developer tools. So I'm going to use, for now at least, the only way I know uh, to show something to the user, which is by alerting. And alerting allows me to create any kind of string. And I would like to create a pretty printed string. So I'm going to use the template literal syntax in order to say the total amount is dollar curly braces in order to start opening a portal to the JavaScript world. And I'm saying total. Full stop. Okay, this should work. So I'm going to copy everything again, uh, clearing everything because it's already too crowded. Go. First item price. I'm gonna put the same name, the same numbers as before. So three, five, two times four. The total amount is twenty-three. Thank you, computer. I didn't know that. It was too difficult for me to to calculate. Okay. So we created our first. JavaScript application. It does something. Well, of course, the numbers were pretty low, but uh, if you have to do some quick maths uh, with uh, more uh, with larger numbers, then maybe this application could be useful to you. Or maybe you can do some other calculations. Uh, there's not just uh, the plus and uh, the multiplication operator there. We're going to see some of them. But a question arises, and this is a question to you guys. I would like you guys to try to answer to this question. I already showed you how every time you ask the user for some information, the user is going to uh, input something, and whatever uh, comes out of the prompt function is not a number, is a string. So if you remember last Saturday, we had to use a function called parse int in order to convert an, a string containing a number into a number. This was our only way to uh, convert the string to a number because otherwise you're not able to uh, sum strings, for example. If you do the string 1, 2, 3 plus the string 4, 5, 6, you already know that this is not going to yield the sum of the two numbers. It's going to be the concatenation of two strings. So I have, if, if I really want to, uh, to do the, the, the calculation, I have to wrap my strings into uh, some function that converts the string into a number. So something like this parse int of 1, 2, 3, plus parse int of 4, 5, 6, which means that the string 1, 2, 3 will be converted into the number 1, 2, 3, the string 4, 5, 6 will be converted into 4, 5, 6 as number, and then the sum will actually be a sum, because it's a sum between two numbers. Uh, it's completely different from this. If I do parse int of the sum, this is not the parse int of the sum. This is the parse int of the concatenation because this plus here is being applied to two strings. So first of all, it concatenates these two strings together and then I parse int the string. So it becomes the number one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, if this sounds strange to you, let's just uh, split the problem into multiple subproblems. So let num one is equal to the string one, two, three. Let num2 is equal to the string 4, 5, 6. I know I'm, I'm forgetting the semicolons once again. I'm sorry. And now that we have these two strings, what is the result of num1 plus num2? These are two strings, so it's just the concatenation. What is the result of parsing num1 plus parsing num2? 
this is actually the sum because before do before uh, using the plus operator i'm converting the strings into number what is the result of parse int of num1 plus num2 this is exactly the opposite in fact the plus is being applied between two strings so i'm concatenating the strings and then I'm parsing the string so it becomes the string one, two, three, four, five, uh, the, the number one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is not a question. I'm sorry if I go uh, too, too forward. The question is since the plus symbol applied to strings does not do the mathematical operation but does the concatenation of strings. So it, last Saturday I had to do parse int. Why? doesn't this apply in our case? In our case, we know that price one, quantity one, price two, and quantity two are strings, but the total is actually a number. It was computed correctly as a number instead of being a concatenation of strings. Why is it like that? Why JavaScript did understand this time that the total should be a number and it should be the result of calculating um, doing performing calculations on numbers instead of strings this is my question to you just waiting a few seconds and a little more because i know that there's some delay in the meantime is there anyone not on discord yet please join discord because i think it's a little oh there's pntm here hi yay Hi, PNTM. I didn't see you joining Discord. Awesome. The street notification was very good. <laughs> okay, I, I like the fact that you, uh, that you see my notifications. I try to make them as fun as possible, just to grab your attention. <laughs> your mood may be variable, but the fun will be constant. <laughs> oh my god, this was a really bad pun. So, Angelo is uh, trying to give an answer. Maybe because the numbers were first multiplied and therefore converted into numbers. You got it. Exactly. Exactly. So, what we usually say in programming is that the plus operator is overloaded, which means that it can have multiple meanings. If you, uh, if you do 1 plus 2 as numbers, the plus means that th this is a sum. While if I do 1 plus uh, 2 as strings, then it becomes a concatenation. And since JavaScript is weakly typed, I can even mix strings and numbers. But if one of them is a string, then uh, JavaScript decides that the plus will be a concatenation. It cannot be a sum. And the same goes if one is the first string and the other is a number. So pl the plus operator is overloaded and it can mean two different things according to the type uh, that it is applied to, the type of the, uh, the values it is applied to. It can be a sum or it can be a concatenation. But this doesn't apply to the uh, asterisk. The asterisk is just a multiplier operator. So if I do two times three as numbers, it is six. And if I do string 2 times string 3, the asterisk is just a multiplication. If, and if it finds two strings, it will automatically convert those two strings into numbers and multiply them. And the same goes if one of the two, one of both, is a string and one is not. So, as you can see, this problem of converting from strings into numbers apparently uh, is only related to the plus symbol. And we can try some other things. For example, what happens with the, with the minus symbol? Same thing. Minus is not deconcatenating strings. The minus symbol is just, the dash symbol, is just to subtract things. So it's going to convert anything um, from, from this uh, operation. I can even try something like... Uh, 4 minus true. 4 minus true is 3. 
Why is that? Well, because 4, yeah, well, the minus operator only applies to numbers. 4 is not a number, it's a string, so it's converted to the number 3. True is not a number. True is Boolean. But as I told you, true is tightly related to the number 1, while false is tightly related to the number 0. In fact, if I try 4 minus false, it gives me 4, because it's like saying that the number 4 minus 0 is 4. So, as you can see, JavaScript's weakly typed system allows you to mix together multiple types in a very strange way. Uh, some developers coming to JavaScript from other languages say that this is nuts, and it is, but as soon as you know uh, how it works, it's not that nuts, it's also pretty cool. And this is also what I showed you here. As you can see, um, it's trying, well, some operations of course work. So for example, four minus false works. But if I say hero minus one, well, this does not work because JavaScript is going to try to convert the string hero into a number, but it is not possible. What is the hero number? Nothing. So it's going to become not a number. N-A-N, which is a kind of strange type. Uh, what is the type of not a number? It's a number. What? <laughs> okay, not a number actually in JavaScript looks like a number that is not a number. Quite strange. These are the quirks of the JavaScript language. What about infinity? I, th I know that there's also infinity. Infinity is actually not considered a number in maths, but here it is kind of a number. Okay. So we've got some strange things, but don't worry too much about these, uh, these problems. Just know that they exist. And they are not the only problems that we have in life. And they're not the only problems that we have in JavaScript. In fact, now I'm going to blow your minds, guys. Do you know what is the sum of 1 plus 2? Of course, it is 3. But do you know what is the sum of 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2? It's not 0 0.3. It's 0 0.3004. What? Uh, this is a problem that we have in JavaScript, but also in uh, many other programming languages. Uh, Java, C Sharp, C, whatever. Probably also in Python. Let's see. Let's see what Python has to say about this uh, sum. What is the result of 1 plus 2? It's 3. What is the result of 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2? Same results. This has nothing to do with the programming language itself. It has to do with uh, the fact that we are doing uh, maths, uh, continuous maths, analogic maths, into a digital device. A digital device is not able to represent the whole continuity of numbers. Uh, there's a very complex thing uh, going on there, but you know that computers deal with zeros and ones, so there's already a conversion here between our decimal system and the binary system that the computer deals with. And uh, when the computer deals with the numbers, uh, it converts them in binary, there is some sort of rounding being applied because a computer with 32 bits only has 32 bits available to describe a number. If our number is larger than 32 bits, than what 32 bits can contain, the number will be rounded somehow. And this is what happens here. This is a rounding problem. The computer converts 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 from the decimal system to the binary system, does the uh, addition here, uh, rounds somehow for some reason, and re um, reconverts the binary number into decimal number and this is the result. So pretty strange but we don't care too much about this because well 0 0.3, 0, 0, 4 is really actually really similar to 0 0.3 so we don't uh, we don't care about this rounding problem. We can still round the result to the first decimal or second decimal and it will kind of work. So there are some quirks with computers and programming languages in general. Uh, there are some problems with JavaScript too. Well, maybe JavaScript has 
more problems than every other programming language because JavaScript is also weakly typed. So you can, you are allowed to subtract one from the string hero, which doesn't mean that it's a good idea. So don't do it. But JavaScript allows you to do it, while other programming languages, even dynamic languages, which uh, don't uh, force you to specify any type, but do have a type, strongly typed, they will not allow you to do such things. Let me show you what I mean about uh, with this. Python. Python. In Python, I can represent a string with single quotes, I think. Hello? Yep, it works. So, can I do hello minus one? No, I cannot. Unsupported operand type for minus, which means that Python is not able to subtract an integer from a string. It's going to give you an error, and it's saying, hey, the types are incompatible. If you want to do a subtraction, it must be a subtraction between two integers. Where did I say that the string is an integer or is a string? Well, this is the dynamic behavior of a dynamically typed language. Uh, I don't need to specify the type. The type is inferred, is deducted from the value. If I say that str is the string hello, then str as a variable, of course, it is a string. And this, as I, if I write it as a number, it is a number. It's an integer, actually. So... Dynamically typed languages do not force me to define the type because the type is automatically inferred, but still, they are strongly typed, which means that I cannot perform an operation between two incompatible types. JavaScript, on the other hand, is weakly typed, which means that I can perform an operation between two different types, but the results can yield to strange results, of course. If I say hello plus one, it's going to be a concatenation. If I say hello minus one, this will be a mathematical operation that has no real good effect. Okay? I hope this is uh, clear. So, bottom line. Yes, Angelo, you were correct. Uh, the total amount is a number because here we don't have only the... Uh, plus operator, we also have the multiplication operator. And uh, the priority of uh, the precedence over operators is exactly the same as in maths. So the multiplication will happen before the sum. And the multiplication will automatically convert the two strings into two numbers, will perform the multiplication, and you will have the uh, no, the, 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 a number as a result. And since you have two numbers on both hands of this uh, plus, then you will have a number as the total result. Okay? Um, if you don't like this, um, this whole calculation, which is too, too long, you can split. Let, uh, let's say total one is equal to price one times quantity one let total two is equal to price two time quantity two. And finally, the total will be the sum of total one plus total two. Maybe this is even more clear, more explicit, even though more verbose. This is a problem that could have been solved in probably, I don't know, even one line of code, but why? Why should I write uh, fewer lines of code in order to solve this problem? Let's be clear and, uh, and be as explicit as possible. Because if you remember, every fool can write a software that a computer can understand, but only a few people, very smart people, can write code that a human can understand. And I'm trying as much as I can to write smart co code, it's code that is uh, readable by human beings because of course the the computer knows how to deal with this stuff okay so this was the solution and of course i'm I, as you can see i'm showing you a lot more than just the solution i'm giving you multiple ways to write the same thing because you have to uh, get accustomed to the language right so instead of just uh, 
uh, uh, learning the, 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 the sentence, what's your name, you have to know that you can also say, what is your name without the contraption? Or uh, how are you called? Or uh, I don't know, how are you named? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You have to start speaking the language and understand that you can write and you can speak in different ways and you will still be understood. You cannot say improper things. So you cannot say, what is, your, what is your slang? Because this has no sense. And in this case too, you can change the code as you wish. And I encourage you to change the code as you see fit. But there are some, some rules that you have to follow. So you cannot say quantities because this will break your code since this is a variable that was never declared before. And you have to do these mistakes, otherwise you'll not be able to understand. You have to be accustomed to the errors that are presented to you. So what did I do? I took the code, but I introduced a mistake. The mistake is I said quantities instead of quantity two. What will happen here is, okay, nothing happens. Give me the first price, three, five, two, four, boom, error. Quantities is not defined. Quantities is not defined where? Line 13, column 23. Usually I don't need the column, but the line information is really, really important. If I look at my code, uh, there's way too much, too much, co too many comments here. Uh, if I look at my code here, I'm looking for line number 13. One, two, three. The blank line is also a line. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't think this is a line, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, it, yeah, this was not a new line, uh, it's actually, okay. Uh, if I go to line 13, line 13 is this one here. And um, this line, if I read it carefully, yeah, there is an error. Quantities was never defined before. So what should I do? Should I define quantities? Or maybe I should change this variable name since it was supposed to be quantity too. So as, as always, the computer is not telling me you misspelled quantity two by naming it quantities. It says just, hey, quantities was not defined. Do you want to define it? No, I don't want to define it. I, want, I just want to fix this problem here. Okay, we've got some feedback. PNTM says, I'm getting alert. The total amount is total instead of the result. Awesome. Okay, so what is the problem with that? Probably, by experience, I can tell you that if the dollar and curly braces is still there, it means that you place this uh, dollar curly braces inside of a string which was created with single quotes or with double quotes. If you use single quotes or double quotes, these are just strings. And as you can see from the color coding here, this dollar curly braces total is green as everything else, which means that this is exactly what is going to be printed uh, on, the, on the browser. So if I do alert, double quotes, uh, the total amount is a uh, dollar curly braces total, I will see the total amount is dollar curly braces total. And the same goes with uh, the single quotes. This is just a string. Instead, in here, we are dealing with template literals, which are special strings that allow you to interpolate JavaScript code, JavaScript expressions, inside of the strings. And this is only available if you use the backtick symbol. The backtick symbol, which is easily uh, available in some keyboard layouts, on Linux, it's pretty easy. On an Italian keyboard, on Linux, it's pretty easy because you have to use alt gr, the rightmost alt, and the uh, single quote. So I can use alt gr quote, and you have this kind of uh, um, of, uh, of backtick. Uh, for other operating systems and other keyboard layouts, it could be a little difficult. Um, for the my Italian fellows, if there is any Italian here. Rani, it are you Italian? You have this it at the end of the name, so I believe that you could be Italian. I don't know, but um, um, yeah, you can find back tick Italian keyboard on Windows. I 
probably suggest you guys, you Windows users, Italian Windows users, to d download this ETA dev keyboard. No, you're Estonian, ran it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, do I know you uh, in person? Because I know some Estonians from the European Innovation Academy. Uh, so you're IT. You're... Uh, Oh, you're Tina. <laughs> I'm sorry. So it's just your name. <laughs> the opposite. Rani, it is Tina Ribane. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get it. Uh, so for any Italian, I don't think there's an Italian here. Uh, so okay, for any Italian, if you have an Italian keyboard and you're on Windows, you can just download this keyboard layout, and you'll have some uh, cool key combinations. Uh, I don't need them because I'm on Linux. I'm sorry, Tina. Sorry. Then it's Ange Angela says, it's uh, is it better from your experience to always use parse int? Because when using brackets for calculations, I think the mistake with strings can still happen, although multiplications are involved. Uh, in my experience, I don't use parse int. I'm going to use something else that you will see in the type conversions. Um, paragraph uh, section so we're going to see what are better time conversions why don't I use parse int the reason is that parse int still behaves strangely with certain strings in fact if I say one two three ABC this is parsed correctly but is it good that one two three ABC is parsed correctly as one two three um, I would like to be more strict and say that if the user inputted 1, 2, 3, A, B, C, the input is wrong. The user should have, wrote, should have written only 1, 2, 3, not 1, 2, 3, A, B, C. So parse int is an old function that uh, was there since probably the early days of JavaScript. But I think that now is superseded by some more strict conversion systems. So your question can be rephrased into... Do you always still convert your strings into numbers even though the multiplication does the conversion automatically for you? Not just with parsing, but with any conversion function. And I would say, yes, Angelo, yes. I would convert every single number uh, and not leaving this to JavaScript. In fact, now we have the multiplication, but maybe one day this calculation will change and we'll only have uh, the, the, the sum. And in that case, I will have a problem because I didn't convert the strings uh, before doing these calculations. So you're totally right. I should always convert my strings into numbers if I have to perform calculations. Very, very good question. Thanks a lot. PNTM's, uh, PNTM in the meantime said, oh, okay, you, yes, I used the single quote. Now it's working. Awesome. You got it. Okay, so I think we started to get the hang of it, and maybe we can add a little more, okay? Let's go to type conversions. So, uh, I think that this is going to tell you almost everything that, you already said, that we already saw. Uh, string conversion, for example. Let's see this code here. Let's try to make sense of this code without without even reading the rest of the documentation. Let value is equal to true. This is not what I'm encouraging you to do. Uh, uh, whenever you, you have to study the documentation, read every single line. But in the meantime, since we are here, we're doing some, uh, another kind of exercise. We're looking at code and we're trying to understand this code. We're trying to do some, we can call it roughly reverse engineering. There's someone who wrote the code. We have to understand what the code is about and, uh, and maybe move forward from them. Uh, it's like hacking. Let value is equal to true. So I think that this variable is automatically a Boolean. If I alert the type of value, it will tell me that it's a Boolean. Do I want to try it? Let's try it. Um, let's me, let me just refresh everything. Oh, come on. Okay, let value is equal to true, it said. Uh, I don't want to alert, okay, let's alert. Alert value, uh, alert type of value, because I want to see the type of this value. And it says Boolean, okay, so dynamic typing 
If I declare a variable and assign a boolean value, then of course this variable will be a boolean. And if I inspect the type of this value, it will be a boolean. So nothing uh, strange here. But if I want to convert this boolean into a string, there's many ways. One of them is to use this strange function, string with a capital S. The capital S is really, really important. So I can say that value now changes value. This variable, I'm assigning a new value to this variable, which is called value, and I'm using string value. So I'm taking the old value and I'm sort of wrapping it as a string, into a string. And now I'll see that the new value of the string is a string containing the, the value true. So string is a way to convert, apparently, a Boolean value to a string. Will it happen, will the same happen with other values? For example, string of one, two, three? Yes, apparently a string, given a number, is giving me a string with that number inside. Uh, what about uh, other kinds of things? What if I do string of null? It's giving me a string containing null. String of undefined? It's giving me a string with the value undefined. What about math? Ooh, this is strange. String of math is giving me a string that contains square brackets, object, space, math. Whatever this means. We will make sense of this, of course, uh, later on. But don't worry, stick with me. Uh, other values? Well, string of a string? Just a string. Okay, so this is a... One of those things that in math they call the idempotent, uh, something like that, idempotent uh, operators. So if you already have a value uh, with the same type in this case, it will just leave it like this. Okay, so this is one way to convert any value to a string. We probably already know another way. For example, if I have the boolean true, I can wrap it into a template literal and I can open the portal to the JavaScript world, well, this gives me exactly the same. I'm taking the, the, the Boolean value and I'm wrapping it inside of a string and it gives me exactly the same result of uh, doing string of value. And the same goes with a number, of course, or whatever I want. So there are multiple ways to do type conversions. I'm converting a Boolean value into a string value, either by using the string function or by just wrapping it into a template literal, or I can, con I can uh, concatenate. I'm using the plus with true in order to have a string called true, with a value of true. And the same goes with numbers, because you already know that the plus operator is going to concatenate if one of the two operator or operands is a string. So I can do conversions even with, uh, with this kind of uh, operator, with the concatenation operator. Um, what about numbers? Well, we know this already. If I try to divide the, num the string 6 with the number... Oh, string 6 with the string 2, well, the division operator is only applied to numbers. So it's going to do the conversion by itself, which means that 6 divided by 2 strings is 3. So how can I convert a, s a numeric value like 1, 2, 3 into a number. One way, a hackish way, that I don't suggest to you, but let's just be creative, could be to divide this string by one. <laughs> and that's it. Or I can multiply it by one. Yep. I cannot sum one, because this way is going to concatenate. But I can probably sum zero. Nope, not even. Uh, sorry, I want to uh, subtract zero, for example. Whatever uh, number I can use in order to perform an operation that doesn't change the result, so dividing by one, um, multiplying by one, or subtracting zero, will give me a numeric result. Uh, this does not apply with the sum, because, as you already know, the sum operator is overloaded. It can mean a sum or it can mean a concatenation. But every other mathematical operator works. Okay, so this is a hackish way, and I'm not saying that you should convert a string into a number this way. Uh, but it, it's, it's something. It's just a way to, to play with stuff. 
Oh, there's also a number uh, function here. We can try. So if I have the string one, two, three, and I wrap it into the number function, number with a capital N, this has pretty much the same, uh, the opposite results of using string. What is string? String value. Okay, so number of string one, two, three gives me a number which is one, two, three. And if I do string of the number one, two, three, it's exactly the opposite. I will have the string from the number or whatever other type I have. So this could be a little better. And you know why it's a little better? Because parse int, as I already showed, parses whatever string starts with numbers. Instead, if I do the same with number, number is going to give me not a number, which means it's, uh, let's say, it's less resilient. But we like the lack of resilience. We want the computer to give me an error if the input was not correct. Because I will want the user to get away with some uh, uh, incorrect input. I want to stop there and say, hey, user, 123FHJDK blah 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 is not a valid number. Please give me a valid number. If instead I want to be more resilient, then I can use parseInt. But parseInt is still not able to do miracles. In fact, for example, if parseInt starts with characters and then continues with numbers, it's still not going to work. So parseInt has this strange behavior in which only if you start a string with numbers, then it is going to work. And there's also another thing that number, I think, works pretty well also with floating point numbers. So if I have 3.14, this works. Well, parse int does not work because it's going to parse an integer, not a floating point, not a decimal number. So if you do parse int of 3.14, you just have whatever is before the dot. But there's also a parse float. I have to say there's also parse float. So 3.14 is correctly parsed as 3.14. And if I put any other character right next to it, it still works. But if I put some characters before it, it's not going to work. So parse int and parse float are an old way to parse a string into an, an, a number, an integer or a float. But now we've got one new function that works every time for both integers and floats. And it's less resilient, which means that whatever character I put uh, after or before is not going to be considered uh, parsable as a number, which probably is better. Okay, as you can see, let age is equal to number given an arbitrary string instead of a number, it's going to give you nan, not a number. The conversion failed, which is better. Um, these are the rules that you should not memorize. Uh, you should, you should probably try them. What happens if you pass a value of undefined? Let's try. Of course, well, we, we already see it, but uh, let's try. If I do number, oops, if I do number of undefined, and I have to write correctly, otherwise uh, it's not going to work. Number of undefined is going to give me none. Let's try again uh, together. Null. Whoa number of null is going to give me zero. Pretty strange. So as you can see, if you have an undefined value or a null value and you try to convert it into a number, it's going to give you a pretty different result. So watch out. Uh, what about number of... Uh, I have no fantasy this morning. What do they say? Null is zero. Oh, true and false. Okay. What is the number associated with false? It's zero it's going to convert the boolean value false into the number zero. What about true? It's one. As I told you, there is a strict correlation between false and zero and between true and one. And uh, what about a string? Well, as you can see, white spaces from the start and end are removed. If the remaining string is empty, the result is zero. Otherwise, the number is read from the string and error gives none. What do they say? They say something new here. I am trying to convert a string to a number. If the string is empty, as in this case, it will give me zero for some reason. If I put any spaces, it's still zero. If I put a number in between, it's going to remove any spaces from the, uh, from the left or the right of the string, and it's still going to parse it. This same goes with floats. 
floating number. But if you type anything that is not a number, or probably if you put some other number uh, in, with, with, uh, in between spaces, it's not going to be considered a number. So this is another cool feature of uh, this number function. It accepts some uh, trailing spaces. Um, trailing and trailing at the end. And uh, how do you say the trailing at the beginning? Oh my God. Uh, well, it allows for some padding. We usually call it padding too. Um, leading, leading and trailing, of course. So, um, so what is parseint able to do the same? So, can I put spaces and then one, two, three? Yes, apparently yes. So, parseint is also able to uh, deal with de with leading and trailing spaces, but it's also really resilient, especially when I have other num. What happens if I do four here? Okay. It's really resilient. I can put whatever I want and it's just going to get the first characters of the string that look like a number and going, it's going to convert them as a number. Um, what else? Let's see these examples. Uh, number of spacey spaces, one, two, three, spacey spaces is one, two, three. Number of one, two, three, z is not a number because number is less resilient than parse int. Number of true will give me one. Number of false is going to give me zero. And I think that we already saw all of this. What about booleans? There is a boolean function, and we can try it immediately before having a look at what they say. I prefer to experiment with things rather than just uh, reading everything carefully at first. Then I'm going to read everything carefully so I don't miss uh, anything. Boolean of false, well, it's already a boolean, so it's going to be false. Boolean of true, it's going to be true. Now, boolean of zero, as you know, zero is totally related to false, so it's going to be false. Boolean of one is going to be true. And what about strings? This is the strange thing that we started witnessing last Saturday. If I do boolean of empty string, the empty string is false. But if the string is not empty, so it contains true, or it contains zero, or it contains false, or whatever, it's always going to say true. And now you probably have uh, a, 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 an understanding of why this is. If you remember, converting a string into a number is giving me a similar result. An empty string gives me zero as a number. A space, well, this is still going to give me zero, actually. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's that's strange. Okay, so it's uh, it's not exactly as I as I was looking for. Zero is going to give me zero. One is going to give me one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so there is a difference. There is a difference between numbers and booleans in this case. Apparently, as you can see, I was assuming something, and then I found out I was wrong. I thought that converting a string to boolean had a double step. It was converting the string to a number and then the number to a boolean. So empty string will convert to number zero and then zero converts to the boolean false. But then I experimented with this. I said, what if I'm wrong? What happens if I convert an, a space to a number? It's going to give me zero. And if I convert it to boolean, it will be false. But it's not this case. If I convert the space string into a boolean, it's not passing through the number. In fact, it's going to give me true instead of false. I don't know if I was uh, clear with this, but as you can see, there's something slightly different between numbers and booleans. And this difference is the truthiness of a value. The truthiness means that a value can be a type that is different from boolean. Maybe it's a string, maybe it's a number, maybe it's null, maybe it's an object. But there is a, some sort of a truthiness or falsiness associated to that value, which means that if I try to convert it to boolean, it will give me either true or false. So uh, the empty string, uh, the, the, the space string, is a truthy value because the space string is not a boolean, but if I convert it to boolean, it is true. And the empty string 
is a falsy value because if I try to convert it to Boolean, then it is false. It is false. Uh, truthiness. Let's see if there's uh, any cool information. Oh, truthiness. I'm sorry. It was with the I. Really sorry for that. Um, I don't think this is good because it's, uh, let's say, truthiness in programming. Truthiness in programming. Oh, is truthiness a legitimate programming term? There's a lot of debate over truthiness. Uh, truth and a truth that comes from the gut, not books. The quality of preferring concepts or facts one wishes to be true, rather than concepts or facts known to be true. Okay. Uh, it really doesn't... Uh, no, it makes not real sense uh, talking about guts over truth. Anyway, truthiness here can be just said as something that is not a Boolean, but if you convert it to a Boolean, it will result into a true. That's it. That's the truthiness of a value. So, as you can see, Boolean from 1 gives me true. Boolean from 0 gives me false. Boolean of any string that has at least one character is going to be true. Only the empty string will give me false when converted to boolean. Please note the string with zero is also true and also the string with spaces inside. So any non-empty string is going to be converted into true. But only in JavaScript. In fact, I didn't even remember this, some languages such as PHP treat zero as false instead. So what is true in JavaScript can be different in other languages. Let's... Tr shall we try with uh, Python? Let's, say how, let's see how to convert a, a string into a boolean in Python. Convert string into boolean Python. Let's see how do you convert. There is a function in Python which seems to be bool. Not boolean with a capital B, but just bool. Let's try it. Python. I'm trying bool of false. False is not defined. <laughs> okay, probably uh, it's false with a capital F in Python. Yeah, bool of false is false. And what about bool of true? <laughs> It's true. Now let's convert something that is not a boolean. For example, bool of zero is false. Bool of one is true. Bool of two, still true. Okay, and what about minus one? Still true. So whatever is not zero is true. And now let's, for, let's go for strings. Bool of empty string is false. Bool of a space is true because it's a non-empty string, which is exactly the same as in uh, JavaScript, bool of zero, the string containing zero, is true, because still, the string is non-empty. So every non-empty string is giving you true when converted to Boolean. So, exactly the same as JavaScript. And as you can see, I don't know much about Python, and whatever I try to do in Python, I have to look it up on Google and Stack Overflow. But as you can see, it's really, really easy to find solutions. And this is most of our programming. We don't need to learn everything by heart, but we know we have to know how to ask nicely Google for things. Uh, we haven't tried Boolean of minus one, but still true. Yeah, in this case too, in JavaScript, whatever value, whatever numeric value is different from zero is always truthy. Well, zero will always be false, converted to false. And here we have the summary. We've got other things here that we haven't tried probably. For example, true divided by false. Ooh, this is cool. So let's try. If I do true divided by true, these are two booleans that will be converted into numbers because the slash operator means division between two numbers. So true becomes one, and one divided by one is true. Never thought about it. What about false divided by true? This is zero, because me it means zero divided by one. And if I say true divided by false, it's exactly the same as saying one divided by zero, which apparently in JavaScript is infinity. What about false divided by false? This is not a number because, well, 0 divided by 0 is an indeterminate 
form, something like that. It's not neither. Uh, it's not infinity. It's not negative infinity. It's nothing. Um, okay, I think that we covered practically everything. Well, we can try other things. Like, uh, what is a number from none? It's none. What about number of infinity? We are converting numbers, which are not numbers, but still considered as numbers, to a number. So nothing is changing here. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that if I do number of infinity as a string, ooh, this works. So infinity is also available uh, as a string and can be converted into a number. What about uh, Boolean from uh, these numbers here? Boolean of not a number apparently is false. Boolean of infinity is true. Boolean of minus infinity? Okay, if I have to make sense of this, I would say that infinity, if considered a number, which is not, is still a very large or a, or a very small number, but not zero. That's why converting it to Boolean still gives me true. Well, not a number, uh, since it's not a number, it's going to be considered a falsy value. I would say it like this. What about Boolean of a string that contains infinity? True, because just because the string is not an empty string. Whatever thing you put inside of here will always give you true, unless it's an empty string, and this will give you false. Uh, Dres Laker says you can represent infinity on a number line, hypothetical number. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but if we want to say, is infinity considered a number? We can see it uh, probably here. Let's go to the philosophy of infinity. Here it is. As many struggled with the foundation of Cali, it remained unclear whether infinity could be considered as a number or magnitude. And if so, how could this be done? Uh, if a line viewed as a set of all its points, their infinite, infinite number is larger than the number of integers. Uh, in this usage, infinity is a mathematical concept and inf infinite mathematical objects can be studied, manipulated, blah, blah, blah. So the fact that infinity can be considered a number I don't know. Yeah, you can write it on the number line, but you cannot say that this point here in the number line is infinity. You have to say that infinity is that way. <laughs> and you have to go very, very far. Anyway, uh, I'm not a mathematician. I would love to be a mathematician, but I'm not. Oh, there's no, no activities here for the type conversion. So let's jump to the next Whereas none has no existence. Yeah, not a number is really not a number. But still, in JavaScript, none is considered a number for some reason. <laughs> because it's in the realm of numbers. It's definitely not a string. But in the realm of numbers, it's not a number. So let's uh, have a look at basic operators. And most of these operators, of course, are related to maths. But we will start seeing operators that are not mathematical. Um, you know almost all of them. There's probably a couple of them that you don't know yet. So first of all, there's a, we have these terms unary, binary and operand. So unary operator is an operator that applies to one operand only. And binary operator is an operand that can be, uh, that is an operator that can be applied to two operands. This is uh, a lot of mathematical mumbo-jumbo, but you already know all of this. For example, the multiplication is a binary operator because it requires two quantities, two operands, in order to perform the calculation. You cannot just say times quantity. What does it mean? Uh, it means nothing. You have to multiply two quantities, uh, not just one. Um, whereas... There are some unary operators, for example, the minus symbol, because the minus symbol, if it's uh, next to a number, it just negates that number. So as you can see here, let x is equal to 1, x is equal to minus x, and if you alert x, you will see that x 
was negated. It's exactly the opposite of its previous value. X was 1, now it's minus 1. So you can write minus X. Cool. And of course, the minus is overloaded, which means that it can be applied to two operands. And if you do Y minus X, it will actually subtract one value from the other. So nothing really uh, difficult here, right? So we've got uh, some new operators here. We've got the addition, which we already know, subtraction, which we already know, multiplication and division, which we already know. We've got this remainder. Remainder is not really that uh, used, but it can be used and it's really useful sometimes. The remainder operator is uh, used mainly in uh, modular maths or when you well in uh, whenever you have numbers that are cyclic for example you want to check what time it is uh, well for me currently it's 11 30 uh, but let's say that we are going to finish at 14 p.m my time at least don't worry, we're not going to go longer than that. It will be 13 UTC, but 14 my time. But what is 14 in 12-based format? I can say 14, 12, uh, 14, uh, reminder, remainder operator 12, and it's saying 2. What does it mean? Uh, this operator says, let's, uh, let's take 14, and uh, let's subtract 12. It's actually a little different. It's uh, let's divide 14 by 12. And apparently 14 divided by 12 is 1 with some remainder. This is the, the result of this operator. This is the remainder of an integer division. 14 divided by 12 is not 1. is 1 with some remainder. In fact, if I do 14... Divide by the 12 um, and just take the integer part. I, I know that 14 divided by 12 is 1 with the remainder of 2. And this is exactly what this gives me. This is the remainder of an integer division. Uh, don't think it's really that important. As you can see, it can be used when you have to deal with uh, the clock because the clock goes from uh, 1 to 12 and then goes back to 1 to 12, 1 to 12, 1 to 12. Um, you can use this with, uh, I don't know, the minutes, because minutes are based on 60. So if you want to see, um, a movie is 200 minutes long, but what does it mean in uh, hours? Well, this is not the meaning in hours, 200 divided by 60. So 200 minutes means that it's 3 hours and 20 minutes long. This division is telling me that it's 3 hours and something. What is this something? Well, let's have a look at the remainder. It's 20 minutes. So apparently, uh, if a movie is 200 minutes long, it's 3 hours and 20 minutes long. In fact, 200 is 180. 180 divided by 60, of course, is exactly 3 hours. So it's 3 hours plus another 20 minutes and you get to the 200 minutes. So, uh, yeah, these, this remainder operator can be useful sometimes, but uh, usually uh, I, I don't use it that often. Not, not as often, of course, as any other, um, any, any other uh, operator here. The exponentiation operator is a new addition to JavaScript. Uh, you can do the exponent. So if you want to say what is 2 to the power of 3, you can do this. 2 asterisk asterisk 3. Even without spaces, it's fine. Uh, what does it mean? Well, you probably know this. You want to multiply 2 by itself 3 times. So 2... Asterisk asterisk 3 means 2 times 2 times 2, 3 times, and that's it. So if you want to use the exponentiation, before this, uh, uh, before this uh, operator, we had to do something else. For example, if we want uh, x squared, let x is equal to 4, and let x squared, before this operator, we have to do something like x times x. 
and that was fine. But of course, if you want to the x cubed or uh, to the exponent of four or five, you don't want to say x times x times x, times x etc. We had to use um, another operator which comes from math. You remember math? Math allows me to get pi, but it also has some functions that we're going to see. Some of them we're going to see them. It was something like exp, I think. And you can say four, well, x to the power of two. No, it was not exp, sorry. It was pow, because this is the power. Exp is a completely, uh, something completely different, I'm sorry. So math pow takes x and raises it to the power of two. Now you don't need to write all of this because the power, the, the, the power operator is part of the JavaScript language with this double asterisk. Do you know, do you have to use this power operator? I don't know, maybe. Maybe someday you'll have to deal with exponentiation and you will know that there is uh, an operator for that. But in the meantime, we don't want to deal with maths and uh, let's just get rid of it. Okay, so remainder, exponentiation. You can use the plus operator to sum numbers, but also to concatenate strings, as you already know. And if you mix the types together, the plus will always give you a string. Freeman says, nice listening to your stream, good explaining of things. Thanks a lot. I think I'm sometimes uh, not explaining that well. So thanks for the encouragement. Um, what happens if you sum multiple things together, but one of them is a string? Well, this is strange. Let's try. Well, of course, you see the comment there, so you probably know the answer. But let's have a look. What if I say 2 plus 2 plus the string 1? 41? Why 41? Well, because as it happens in maths, the priority of operators starts from left to right. And there are some uh, operators that have a higher precedence. But in this case, we have the same operator everywhere. We've got only the plus symbol in all the expression. So we have to um, compute the operation from left to right. I have the number 2 and I want to sum it with the number 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. So this results in 4 plus the string 1. And now we've got a number plus a string. And this, of course, is not an, uh, uh, an addition anymore. It's not a sum anymore. It must be a concatenation. So it will be 41. Which is kind of strange because if I say 2 plus 2 plus 1, this is giving me a completely different result. But you know why now? Because the operators are computed from left to right. So first of all, I have to do this sum, which is not a sum, it's a concatenation. And this will give me 22 plus the number one, which is going to give me the concatenation of the three. And this is it, okay? So kind of strange to deal with the different types with weakly typed languages such as JavaScript, but once you understand it, oh wait, it gives you exactly this, well, almost exactly the same, the same thing that I tried, uh, even though, well, it, it changed numbers. So the string one plus the number two plus the number two will do the concatenation, which gives you a string, and concatenation of a string with a number is still going to give you a string. Well, in this case, we've got first some numbers and then a string. So how do we deal with multiple types? As Angelo was saying before, you first convert everything to the same type so you don't incur into these kinds of problems. So just use the number operator in order to convert everything. If you want to sum 2 plus 2 plus 1 and you want it to be a sum, then it's much better if you first convert this one into a number. Or if this thing comes from the user, same thing. You do a number of whatever is prompted from the user. Last number. Last number is one. I convert it and it becomes five. You see how easy it could be to just uh, convert everything into the proper type and then perform all the calculations. Um, you know about this, you know that every other operator which is not a plus is not 
overloaded as a plus. So 6 minus the string 2 will convert the string into a number, not vice versa. And the same goes with the division operator, because the division can only be performed between numbers. So if I have two strings, they will be automatically converted into numbers and then divided. Um, you also have a unary plus. I didn't know about this actually, but if you have a 1 and you do plus x, it stays 1. And you have a minus 2 and you do plus y, oh, it remains minus 2. So, okay, I knew about this one. Uh, it's not really that important with numbers, because if you have any number and you add a plus to it, it stays like that. But you can do strange things with a plus symbol. For example, you can convert a boolean into a number by adding a plus. Since the plus can only be applied to numbers, then plus true will force JavaScript to, converse this, to convert this boolean value true into the number one, and it will give you one. And the same goes with the string, the empty string. Plus can be applied only to numbers, if it's a unary plus, then the empty string will be converted into a zero. But it's much better to use the number, uh, the number function because it's more uh, explicit and it's more fail-safe. Sometimes I do this kind of hackish things. Uh, I'm going to show you other operators such as the exclamation mark. And sometimes if I have a string or a, maybe a number like three and I want to convert it to a, into a boolean, I use this strange operator, not not. I'm going to, to tell you what this, is, what this means, but uh, not for now. It's still, it's a hackish thing. Maybe it's much better to use boolean of three, and it will give you the same results, but it's much more explicit, much more ex uh, understandable. Hey, leave you fun. Why is that so? I'm really sorry, but I just saw your message, so I'm not really sure what you're, why, what are you referring to? Probably this plus. Why is the plus uh, empty string is going to give me zero? Let's see if this was the question. Well, I, I think that, oh yes, okay. So um, let's remind that JavaScript is a weakly typed language. So you can mix t different types together and JavaScript will do its best to automatically do the conversion from one type to another in order to perform that operation. So in this case, we've got a Boolean value true. And we already saw that the Boolean value true, if I try to convert it to a number, is going to give me the number one. In fact, there's a strict correlation between the Boolean value true and the number one. And the same goes with the Boolean number false and the number zero. So curious why you set follower only chats. I did? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, you know why? Because I, f I was afraid that people coming from outside were going to spam and, uh, and disturb and distract. But maybe it's not that case. So I can uh, open the chat to, to everyone. That's fine for me. I think that if anyone cares enough to uh, open a Twitch account and follow the, 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 the channel, then probably that person is uh, more likely to uh, write pertinent messages, but probably not. Follower-only chat can be very off-putting, especially if you're not a very big streamer. Okay, thanks for the tip, Freeman. Uh, you know what? I'm going to change this setting uh, during the coffee break, which is in uh, uh, 15 minutes. So thanks for the tip. I'm going to change this setting right away um, if you think it's better for me. I'm, as you can see, I'm a small streamer and I don't uh, really know how Twitch works yet. So I welcome every, any kind of suggestion that you guys can give me. Not just my opinion. I heard many people say that. Awesome. Then <laughs> yeah, I'm totally convinced. I was already convinced when you told me your opinion, but since you're saying that it's not only your opinion, then I'm, uh, I'm definitely bought. A big streamer might use that to get less messages, I guess. But yeah, probably I want to get more messages and I'm going to, to get, uh, I'm going to change these settings. So I was saying, Boolean values, if you convert them to numbers, are pretty straightforward. True becomes one, 
false because it becomes zero. So if I'm using any operator such as one plus true, the plus can be applied with strings if uh, one of these two operands is a string and then it's a concatenation or it will definitely be a sum between two numbers but this is not a number so it will be converted into a number one and so one plus two becomes two and the plus symbol can also be used as a unary operator so i can say plus one and it will just give me one plus minus one it's going to still give me minus one and what if I apply it to something that is not a number for example true well true is automatically converted into a number so it becomes one I hope that this makes sense to you as a small streamer it is easy to ban spammers etc and happens rarely okay okay um, thanks uh, a few uh, maybe last week or two weeks ago we had one person that joined in the party and was asking me what's the Taylor series expansion of uh, sine x over x, which is not really that pertinent, but, um, but that's fine. It was just one person, and I've been streaming for three months now, so um, it's, uh, it can be done. Okay, so um, what else? We know that if we sum two strings, it will be a concatenation. We know now that if we put a plus in front of these two strings, those two strings will be automatically converted into numbers before doing the sum. Uh, okay, Leave you fun says, so the true is one and false is zero, and all the numbers except zero, with not not zero will be false, and not not, true is tr and not, not three is true. Exactly. Uh, but I haven't explained the plus plus symbol, uh, the, sorry, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, the not not operator. So yes, exactly, this is true, and I will show you right away. Funny how you can get minus zero. Oh, you can? Let's see. Can I do plus zero? It's zero. Can you do minus zero? Yeah, it's true. I can have minus zero. And... Uh, does this have a meaning? Uh, I would say no for now, but if you're into calculus, you know that you can approach zero from the right or from the left. And in that case, minus zero has a little more sense. But we're not doing any calculus right now. So yeah, it's cool. We can have minus zero. Why not? Um, so what the, what the tutorial says right now is that if you want to, I'm too old for calculus, me too, me too. I did calculus something like 20 years ago and I don't remember anything. Not even the Taylor series of sine x over x. I'm sorry for that, but uh, in 20 and more years of programming, I found out that there's no need for that kind of information when programming, which is sad because I loved calculus, but still, uh, we don't care about that right now. So, uh, I can do a plus three plus plus five and this is strange but it allows me to convert these strings the strings into numbers before performing this plus operator so you know that the string three plus the string five is going to do a concatenation but if you add a plus before every string it automatically converts those strings into numbers which is a new thing that we now learned we can do a times one as i as i showed you or divided by one or you can uh, what did we do uh, minus zero or you can do just uh, plus three or probably even minus minus no minus minus is not going to work but maybe I can do something with parentheses. Yeah, <laughs> if I add parentheses, I'm going to negate the string three, which becomes minus three, and then I'm going to negate it again, and it just becomes three, uh, or just plus three, and it gives you exactly the same result. I'm just playing around. You're not supposed to write JavaScript this way, but as you can see, we can play around with the operators, with numbers, with different types and see what happens. And this will give us a much better understanding of the language. And so I don't encourage you to do this. I encourage you to do the longer variant, as they say. You have to convert the apples to a number with the number function, which is much better. This is also 
pretty difficult to read. All these crosses here looks like a graveyard. Instead, number apples plus number oranges uh, is pretty explicit. You are converting apples into the number, you are converting oranges into a number, and then you are doing the sum. Precedence of operators. You already know about this, but if you say 1 plus 2 times 2, then 2 times 2 has higher precedence. So it's going to be not 1 plus 2, which is 3, times 2 is 6, but it will be 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. If you want to make this sum have higher precedence, just like in uh, basic maths, you have to add parentheses. You can add parentheses in JavaScript too. And these are, this is the list of precedence. So the unary plus, unary negation have higher precedence. Then we've got the exponentiation, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, blah, blah, blah. The assignment is one of the least significant, the least, uh, that had the least priority. Um, but this is all maths, and you don't want to deal with maths, I think, for, at least for now. Uh, there's also another cool thing here, uh, which is this. The assignment operator does not just assign a value, it also returns that value. And you probably already understood this whenever we created something like uh, let variable is equal to, uh, let variable and then variable is equal to 3 if i say variable is equal to 3 it's going to return this value 3 so the assignment operator is actually returning this value it's not just assigning the value but it's also assign uh, it's also returning the assigned value freeman says attention gain did you say math <laughs> I said math, but I also know that some people are scared of math, and I even mentioned Bezier curves twice, but just for the sake of transitions and other things, I don't want to get into the details of math, at least for now. Let's see what happens later on. Libufon says, is plus three more efficient than number three? Uh, I would say probably yes. I would say probably yes, because uh, the plus symbol is just a very basic operator that probably is uh, computed in the, uh, in the processor right away, while wrapping the string 3 into this function number is probably going to create an object and create all this conversion logic, so it's probably a little less efficient to use this number function, but we don't care. We don't care about efficiency. If you have to create a game engine, then don't write the game engine in JavaScript. Uh, write it in C, in C++, or probably even better in the Rust language. And you can go really, really low level and use this kind of uh, efficiency hacks. But now it's pretty standard. If you have to write an application, it must be performant enough not as performant as possible. In fact, lots of mistakes that developers do are made for the sake of performance. <clears throat> and this is um, also a pretty important statement, um, which I will never find, but uh, mistakes for the sake of performance. Uh, optimization. Nope. Um, wait a second. Uh, premature. This is it. Let's see if I can find... Well, the, the, the most important quote is this one here. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. If you are now looking for an, op an optimized version of your code, you're probably going to uh, dirty your code with uh, strange symbols, such as the plus graveyard that we saw uh, right before, and it's not going to really optimize anything. Your code will still be performant enough. It will just be less readable, so less, uh, uh, op less optimizable too, less uh, flexible, less readable, less uh, changeable, less flexible. So we don't want to do this error, which is premature optimization. Remember that you are relying on some really cool software, the V8 engine, 
on, uh, on, on Chromium and on Node.js. So there are some optimization being performed under the hood for you by the compiler or the interpreter in this case. So don't strive for, for optimization. In fact, if you strive for premature optimization, you will probably get into trouble pretty soon. PNTM says, so the Cyberpunk 2077 glitches is due to the mistakes in programming, damn it. Uh, yes, they are, uh, but not probably due to optimization. Uh, Cyberpunk 2077 is an AAA, AAA uh, game, which means that it probably is created with uh, an important engine, such as the Unreal Engine. I don't know what the engine, uh, what the, what, what engine they used. But uh, still, on top of an engine, you have to program a lot. And sometimes, yeah, you can, uh, you can make a lot of mistakes in programming. And a game is even more complicated, because in programming, you have a lot of physics to simulate. And what I learned recently, especially, because I'm, I'm trying to create my own uh, 2D game engine, is that when you want to deal with complex physics, you cannot just say, hey, take this character from position A to position B. And you're not even supposed to say, hey, add a velocity to this character so this character will move. You usually say, hey, apply this force or apply this uh, potential, uh, this power. And uh, in that case, the simulation gets, uh, is, well, let's say it's, um, it's more unreliable. It's, um, you, cannot, uh, you cannot tell ahead of time what he's going to do. It's, it, it becomes lively because there's so many variables going on, changing at the same time, that you apply a force and then you hope for the best. You hope that the forces will lead your character to some place, but then you forget, oh no, but there's an obstacle in there, so the character will just move through the obstacle. And there can be rounding mistakes. So for example, a character is approaching a wall but due to rounding mistakes, the next position of the character will be right after the wall. Because, because, because of rounding mistakes, it didn't take into account that between position A and position B, there was a wall to, to take into account. So there's a lot of potential mistakes that you can do in games. A lot more than with, uh, with the usual web application programming. Making games is really, really tough. And I would love to do that, but uh, I took another course. But maybe I'm still on time. I'm not even 40 yet. Uh, I don't want to distract from the lesson, Leave You Fun says. I don't think you are distracting us from the lesson. That is what engines are created, so you don't have to do the dirty work. Yes, it is true, but uh, sometimes you also have to write some... Uh, you have to also do some dirty work. Uh, the engine will not do everything for you. You still have to, to write some, some code. Um, okay, no, but you're not distracting. I think that these trivia and this discussion is still very interesting and very important in order to make this lesson not just a boring lesson about programming. We can also uh, talk about the context and uh, other current events. Why not? Okay, so as apparently the assignment operator returns a value. Do we really need to know this? Well, yes, because there's some moments in which I can find some problems. For example, look at this code. Let A is equal to 1, let B is equal to 2. Okay, we've got two variables, A and B. One has a value of 1 and one has a value of 2. But now C is a new variable which is the result of a calculation. The calculation is 3 minus A equals to B plus 1. What? Well. What happens here is that I compute b plus 1, and since it's b is 2, b plus 1 is 3. And I assign this value, 3, as a new value of a. So a is now 3. And then I do 3 minus, well, the result of this expression apparently is 3, so 3 minus 3 is 0. But in the meantime, I also changed the value of a, which means that now a has changed the value, c has now the value of 0 as expected, but now I have this kind of side effect. I mixed an expression that does a calculation with an expression that assigns a value to the variable. This makes the code really, really difficult to read. I don't want to do this. If I want to assign a value, 
a new value to the variable and do this calculation, I would definitely uh, do them in two steps. So let a is equal to one, b is equal to two. I would say a is equal, oops, a is equal to b plus one. And then I would say this is the new value of a. This yields exactly the same result, but now everything is under control. I can see that on line number three, I assigned a new value to a. So if I inspect the value of a, it will give me three. Then if I inspect the value of c, it will give me zero. This is under control. This, what is this? Uh, this is not under control because maybe it's really, really difficult to find in the expression the fact that there is an assignment going on. So I would really, really suggest you not to write code like this. Leave your fun says, but it also becomes three. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, A becomes three. So there's a side effect going on in this expression. PNTM says, probably it is better to give the variable D is equal to B plus one instead of A is equal to B plus one, since the A equal one becomes redundant. Leave your fun says, it's like using multiples eagles, like A is equal to B is equal to C is equal to one plus three. Yes, exactly. We're mixing many things together. You know what? In my case, all of them are four. Yeah, exactly. If you do A is equal to B is equal to C is equal to one plus three, all of them become four. And it's really, really difficult to, to tell. Uh, you know what? In my particular case, you already know it. I'm a fan of functional programming and I'm a fan of immutable values. So in my case, what I would write is something like const a is equal to one. So I'm sure that nobody will be able to change this value. And I cannot do this because a constant has been already declared somewhere in this page. So I have to refresh the browser and go from the start. Const a is equal to one. Refreshing the browser completely wipes out what everything I created in the console. So I can start fresh with a constant a equal to one. Then we have a constant b, which is equal to two, if I remember correctly. Where is that uh, here? Yeah, b is equal to two. And then if I want to assign a new value to a, in my particular case, I prefer to create a new constant. For example, new a. New a is equal to b plus one. Um, b plus one. And finally, c will be, what was that, three? Yep, three minus the new value of a. This is exactly the same as before, but now if I inspect all the variables, I have a is still one, b is still two, I have new a, which holds the new value of a, and I have C, which is equal to zero. As you can see, I'm more of a fan of uh, storing every single result of a calculation in a different variable instead of uh, uh, reassigning values. Because if I assign a new value to the first variable, I lose its previous value. And maybe this previous value was useful because I want to, I don't know, I want to, do, uh, to compare these values. What is the difference between new A and A? I can do this, while if I reassigned a value to the same variable, I couldn't do this kind of calculation. So I think that this is more predictable, let's say. Uh, th that's, that's the word that I was looking for, even for game engines. Game engines are really unpredictable, because if you mesh in physics, uh, then it could happen that this physics works in an unpredictable way. And this is the, the same goes for here. If you start writing unpredictable code, like this one, because you overlook the fact that there's an assignment in here. Maybe you, you look at it from afar and you see A minus B plus one, and it doesn't look like an equal, uh, an assignment operator, then the code becomes more unpredictable. The code is much more predictable if you instead uh, store the results of any uh, intermediate calculation in a different variable or even a constant. But, of course, using variables like this is fine too. So, it's 12.03 my time, which means that we spent already two hours together. We are going to spend another two hours together, but we'll have a short coffee break. Five minutes, as always. And uh, so, enjoy your coffee. We'll be back at uh, 12.08 my time. 11.08 UTC. Bye. Have a good coffee. Uh, short pause.
a few moments later. Here I am again. Hi. I hope you had a nice coffee. I didn't because I wanted to do two things. First of all, I wanted to catch up with the messages and I saw just now, Freeman, that you said that recently you've been doing some math proofs using interactive theorems provers. It was really fun. That's awesome. So you are a programmer, right? You are writing programs that prove theorems. That's really, really cool. And um, another thing, I wanted to welcome your suggestion, Freeman42x. So I hope that I did it correctly. I went to moderation and I turned off followers only mode here. And I also turned it off from here, from the channel settings. So now I think that everyone, even not followers, can chat and even make clips of my streams. If anybody wants to do that, I don't think so. And um, I also had a look at this website in which I saw this quote from Donald Knuth in The Art of Computer Programming. Donald Knuth says, the real problem is that programmers have spent far too much time worrying about efficiency in the wrong places and at the wrong times. Premature optimization is the root of all evil, or at least most of it, in programming. Um, I think he's right. And what I love about this, uh, this quote is that it comes from a book that, com that is named The Art of Computer Programming. And if you know my opinion on this, I completely agree that computer programming can be considered an art if you make it well enough. In fact, everything can be considered an art. I'm going to quote again the famous quote from St. Francis of Assisi that I even put on my website. He who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman. He who works with his hands and his head and his heart is an artist. I love this quote and I think it can be applied to any kind of activity that we do. If you do it blindly, uh, bored, it's not, uh, it's not art. But if you start giving your, your head and your passion into it, then it can really become a form of art. Uh, a form of art. Um, have a look at the, web, uh, the Inglourious Coders website, especially uh, here there are links to every thing that relates to me. So if you want to join Twitch, if you want to join to look at the YouTube channel when I see where I see awesome bots spamming love messages. Um, we also have a Discord server, which I'm probably <laughs> you love the fact that the Discord channel is made. Uh, then you will have to explain to me why is it good to have Discord because I like Discord but I still don't understand it enough. So please, please tell me. Um, what is that? No, wait a second. I want this link. How do I create an, an, ex, an eternal link like before? I had this Slack channel and I'm going to copy this link and I'm gonna put it in the Twitch channel for every, anyone who wants to join right away. Uh, Lee View Fun says an art is about creating emotions inside the viewers. Yes, I think you're right. Um, but I think also that if you don't have any viewers, and you, if you don't have an audience at all, you can still create art. Uh, the only thing that you need is actually give your soul and your passion into it. Even if you have nobody seeing your art. There probably are many artists that die alone and broke, and then their art is appreciated only after their death. And, but it's, it was still art before having any viewers out there. You build it inside yourself. Yeah, probably I am the viewer of my own art. I can be that. And as for I, of course, I'm uh, I'm referring to you guys too. Yes, I love the fact that Discord channel is made. Okay, um, let's get back to business, right? So let's go premature optimization. We already saw that it's bad. So let's not go with premature optimization. We were looking at operators and we saw the assignment operator that allows you to also return something which is not that important and that useful. In fact, this fact of uh, returning what you assigned is actually a thing to know because 
it can lead to unexpected results. And we're going to talk more about these unexpected results rather than the utility, the usefulness of this uh, uh, returning uh, that comes from the assignment operator. You can chain assignments together, but as you can declare uh, multiple variables together in the same line, please don't do this. <laughs> it's not readable. I like your way of teaching. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, I like your way of uh, attending and listening, really. You're, uh, uh, I like the fact that you're interacting a lot with me. It's, uh, it's really giving me um, a good feedback and uh, it's really, really useful because, well, I used to teach to uh, an, uh, an offline law audience and I see the faces and uh, the only way I can have feedback from you guys is by your chat messages and your chat messages in particular are really, really useful and important. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the support. Um, so chaining assignments, don't chain assignments and don't chain declarations, variable declarations, because there's no, no real need. It may just makes the code less readable. You can still do something like C is equal to two plus two, and then B has the same value of C, and then A has the same value of C. This is way, way more readable. Uh, it says it's here too. That's easy to read, especially when I scanning the code fast, when you're reading the matrix. Modify in place. This is another thing that it's not a new rule. It's uh, one of the recipes that you can start applying where, as soon as you understand the rules. And as you can see, uh, nothing new here. You can say let n is equal to 2. Then n will be n plus 5. Then n is multiplied by 2. You can do this kind of things. You can assign a new value to the same variable by using the previous value, value and applying some operator to it. But there's also a shorthand which is really, really famous and important. If you have to do n is equal to itself plus 5, you are somehow incrementing the value of n by 5. You're saying that the new value of n is the previous one plus another 5. Well, there is an increment operator which is plus equals. If you do n plus equals 5, it is exactly the same as saying n is equal to n plus 5. So it's a new operator. It's optional because you can still achieve the same result with n is equals n plus 5. But, you know, it's widely used, especially you will see it used uh, in, uh, in loops, uh, which we haven't discussed yet. But yeah, this is a, a convenient form that we usually uh, used to increment a value with the uh, specific steps. So let's do, let's try something. So I don't know. Um, I can have a coffee break, which is five minutes. But if this coffee break is not enough for you, I can add another five minutes to the coffee break. Coffee break is equal, wait a second. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I, d I spelled coffee wrong. I'm gonna do it again, no? Coffee break with two E. Or we can say cov fefe, but this goes to, into political, so no. Coffee break is equal to five. Let coffee break is equal to five. So this is the initial uh, value of coffee break. We had a coffee break of five minutes. It is, is it not enough? Then I can say coffee break plus equals to five. And this is going to take the previous value of coffee break and add another five minutes to the coffee break. And now, as you can see, this is exactly the same as taking the last value of coffee break, which was five, adding another five. Oh, you, get, you got it, cof veve or cof ve, cof fefe, cof fefe or coffee, coffee, yeah. Um, so coffee break plus equals five is exactly the same as saying coffee break is equal to coffee break plus five. You know that uh, this is a sum, you know that this is a, an assignment operator and the assignment operator is actually returning also the new value. No, but, but that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, it's still a, a complete uh, made up word. So uh, I think that kof veve is, uh, has the same worth of uh, kof fefe. So coffee break is equal coffee break plus five is exactly the same as doing coffee break plus equals five. It's just uh, shorter 
and it's less error prone because you have a fewer variable names to write. So if I have to increment some variable, probably I would do this. An unknown error occurred when fetching the script. This is unrelated to what we are doing. This is probably due to some extension that I have installed on my browser. So don't worry about this unknown error. And we can do the same for multiplication. So you can say n times equal to, which means take the previous value of n and multiply it by two. Let's say that a, a 10 minutes coffee break is not enough. Then I will double the time. Coffee break times equal to. And from the previous value of 10 that I had, it should become 20. Yes, it is. So the new value of coffee break is 20 and the assignment also returned it immediately, right away. And this is it. We can probably try to do the same with the other operators. Let's see if it works with the minus operator, for example. Coffee break minus equals, I don't know, two. Will it work? Yes, it does. So it works also for subtraction. Will it also work for division? Let's uh, divide uh, coffee break by six. Yeah, it still works. Um, let's now assign a new value, like, um, I don't know, 27. And let's try to see if I can use the exponential operator. Uh, two. Will I make it square? Ooh, it works. <laughs> this was really, really new for me. I didn't know it, it would have worked. Okay, it works even with the exponential operator. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, you can try other operators if you if, if you come up with new operators, uh, but I think that we just have these ones for now, the mathematical ones. Oh, there's also the remainder. Yeah, it works too. So you can use also the remainder operator. As you can imagine, every single one of these assignment and increment operator is exactly like saying coffee break, for example, this last one, is equal to itself percentage two, whatever it means, okay? This is exactly the same as this one here. And this is the only thing you need to know. What if you need to do coffee break is equal to two remainder coffee break. Can you uh, make it shorter with an assignment operator like this? Well, no, <laughs> you cannot. Uh, this assignment operator only works as a replacement of coffee breaks. A coffee break is equal to the same variable and then the operator. If you want to do uh, operator and then the value, well, you cannot shorten it. So you still need to, to do it like this. Apart from, of course, uh, whenever it, uh, it makes sense. So coffee break is equal to five. And if you want to represent coffee break is equal to five plus coffee break, well, this is exactly the same as saying coffee break plus five, because, you know, you can uh, interchange the two operands and the sum will be exactly the same. So in this case, this, is equivalent to coffee break plus equals five. Of course, but not because it, the plus is special. It's just because you can uh, swap, swap the two operands and make them look like this. And then you already know that this looks is exactly the same as this. And as you can see, it's still incrementing by five every time I call it, okay? Um, let's see if there's anything else we need to know. Yeah, of course, you can do let n is equal to 2, and then you multiply n by itself, uh, well, it's itself times 3 plus 5. So it's going to do 3 plus 5 before, which is 8, and then 2 times 8 is 16. So in this case, it looks like, um, it looks like the, the sum has a high precedence over the multiplication, but if you think about it, it's not. The sum has not a higher precedence over multiplication. Let's, uh, let, let's um, break it down. So let n is equal to 2. And then this guy says n times equals 3 plus 5. n times equals 3 plus 5. As I told you, the result of this operation is I do 3 plus 5, it's 8. 
And then this means that I'm doing n is equal to n times 3 plus 5. The parentheses in this case are implicit, but they are being applied. So as you can see, there's no, it's not that the plus symbol has higher precedence over the multiplication uh, operator. It's just that we are first doing the, uh, the sum and then we're doing the increment. The increment has lower precedence over the, uh, over the, the sum. Because we already know that the sum has still a higher precedence over the assignment. The assignment has the lowest precedence. So I'm first doing all the different operations and then finally I'm doing the assignment. The assignment including this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, increment operator. Increment decrement. If you want to increment and you want to increment by one, or this of course is a 16. If you want to increment by one, what do you do? You say, my number is one, and then you do num plus equal one, and this is going to increment by one. This is just a shorthand for saying num is equal to num plus one. We already know this. Well, but if you increment only by one, there's even another shorthand operation, which operator, which is the plus plus num plus plus increments by one if you want to increment by two you have to write plus equal two there's no way to use the plus plus to increment by two you have to use this number plus equal two or number is equal to number plus two but if you want to increment by one you can use this plus plus symbol num plus plus and there's also a minus minus in order to decrement by one but what you see here is actually pretty strange so you see here, I said number is equal to number plus one. And since number was two, it gives me three. Number plus plus is giving me three. No, it should be four. And number four minus minus is giving me four. No, it should be three now again. So what is happening here? Let's go back one step. Let number is equal to one number is equal to number plus one or yeah plus two what this gives me is take the number which is one add two the new value of number is three and the same value will be given as a result so i see three no not nothing new here let's go let's start again let's num is equal to one and now num plus equals two, which is the same thing as I wrote before. This is giving me still three. And if I inspect the number, it's still three. Awesome. But this looks like something different uh, in when, uh, when using the plus plus symbol. Let's try again. Let num is equal to one. Now I want to increment by one so i'm doing let num is equal to num plus one and of course num is now two and it's being returned to let's add again but this time i'm using the plus equal symbol awesome it's inc it incremented once again and the value now is three i can still inspect the value it is three what if i use now the plus plus symbol it's returning three but if I inspect the value, it's actually four. So what is happening here? Well, the plus plus symbol has this strange um, behavior in which the number is actually incremented by one, but the operator itself is returning the current value of number, not the updated value of number. In fact, num plus plus is giving you the previous value of num, which was three, but then if you inspect the variable, it's actually four. So it returned the current value and then incremented the value. You can also use the plus plus before num. And in that case, you will have the result that you expect. So it will increment the value and then it will return the value to you. So the num is now four. It will increment the value to five and then return the new value to you. So I will see five. And if I inspect the value of number, it's five. So as you can see, this num plus plus is pretty strange. It's going to increment the value, but only after it's being returned to you. And uh, 
it is strange, but it's the most widely used increment operator when you have to do loops. So you have to know this. Nowadays, I usually don't use this increment operator anymore because when I do loops, I do them in a completely different way, which we will see together, of course. But still, it's really, really important to know these things because, well, if you plan to build games and game engines, you have to deal with numbers, you have to deal with math and physics, and you have to increment variables uh, most of the times. Okay, so you have to know these things. As you can see, let counter is equal to two, counter plus plus increments the value, and then when you alert the counter, you will see the value being updated. But what they don't say here right now is that this expression is already returning something, and what is being returned is not the new value, it is actually the old value, strangely enough. You can do the same with decrement, it's exactly the same thing. Um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, this is uh, something that I never thought of. Increment and decrement operator can only be applied to variables. If you try 5++, plus plus, it's going to give you an error. I didn't know this. I never tried. 5++, plus plus, and that's true. Uh, so, plus plus can only be applied to a, num uh, a variable and not just a plain value. And what about 5 plus equals 5? Same, you cannot use this uh, increment, decrement operator on just values. You can, you have to use variables. Another reason why you shouldn't understand variables. Okay, what else? I already told you this. You can use the plus plus or the minus minus before the variable. And this has the results of incrementing before resulting, before, before returning the value. Um, so this is a strange thing. You have let counter is equal to one. So counter is one. Let a is equal to plus plus counter. You already know that this means that the counter will be incremented by one. So counter from one becomes two. And the result of this will be stored in variable a. And if I print the variable a, of course I will get two. This makes a lot of sense. What makes less sense is that if you use the plus plus symbol after you can incur into this kind of uh, strange situation let counter is equal to one let a is equal to counter plus plus counter will be incremented but the previous value of counter will be returned and stored in variable a before being incremented so you will see that the value of a when you log it when you when you show it is still one it's not two strange so uh, I would say that in general it would be preferable to use the plus plus because it makes more sense. But it doesn't. No. In loops we usually use the plus plus on the right side. You will see why. So I usually don't use the plus plus like this. I usually more the plus plus here if I'm really forced to use plus plus symbol. But I'm usually not even using it. Uh, okay, we've got some more examples here. Let counter is equal to zero, counter plus plus, plus plus counter, and you can see what is the result. The final result is actually two. So if you have a, such a code, it doesn't make that much sense between having plus plus after or plus plus before. You do the, you do the initialization, counter is zero, then you increment in a way, then you increment in another way, but at the end of these three lines, Still, the counter will be incremented, and from zero, it went to one, and then it went to two. So it doesn't make that much difference which kind of increment operator you're using if you inspect the value of the variable after everything is done. It makes a lot of uh, difference instead if you're inspecting the value of the counter while you are incrementing it. And that's the reason why I told you before Please never get the value of something while you are changing it. It's always a, a bad idea. Uh, let me go back to the, to the previous example. Here, I'm assigning a value to A and getting the value, the new value of A, while doing some other calculations. I already told you, that's a bad idea. Let's split these calculations and these returns into multiple steps. It is much better because it's much more readable. And now you have one more reason. If you're using these uh, increment or decrement operators, it is much more fail-safe 
if you do the increments as you wish and then only then on a new line you inspect the new value of the of the counter but if you instead increment and get the value of the counter on the same line like this you could incur in some unexpected behaviors well unexpected because you didn't study enough because they are pretty uh, logical uh, results if you know what you're doing okay you can do lots of other things like uh, mixing multiplying two times and then an incrementing of a counter but don't do this just don't do it do it for the sake of just uh, you know um, studying and experimenting but don't do it in production we also have bitwise operators but it's not really that important to see bitwise operators bitwise operators operate on numbers and they treat numbers as binary numbers and there's no reason unless you are dealing with binary numbers there's no reason to use bitwise operators i can show you one example of a bitwise operator for example what if you have to take the number eight and multiply by two you already know how to do that you do eight times two and this is the number eight multiplied by two but you can do something else because 8, if you represent it as a binary number, it's actually 100, zero, zero, if I remember correctly. And if you want to multiply a binary number by 2, you just need to add an extra 0. And this is the number that represents, in binary, the number 16. So, if you want to go fancy and use bitwise operators, you can say 8 should be shifted to the left by one bit and this gives you exactly the same result this allows javascript to treat those two uh, numbers eight and one as binary numbers eight becomes one zero zero and shifting left by one means adding another zero at the end of it and if you convert this binary number into decimal it's 16 why should I use this bitwise operator instead of the multiplication operator? Well, because the processor is, uh, does this computation faster. Uh, shifting a number by one bit is faster than do doing this multiplication by two for a processor. But unless you are creating something that requires a lot of performance, this makes no sense. This makes a lot of sense. So if you need to multiply by two, please use the multiplication operator instead of the bitwise operator. This is just for the sake of, uh, of telling you. And you can also shift le uh, right and you will divide by two. So just use the mathematical operators that you already know on decimal num on, on, uh, on, how do you say that? Decimal numbers, on um, base 10 numbers. Do not use bitwise operators, please, unless you're using really uh, binary numbers, okay? I'm not going to go further on this. I'm not going to tell you anything about the comma operator. I think that it's much better if you don't know about the comma operator. We already saw the comma operator being used, for example, for declaring two variables, let A and B. But don't, don't use a comma operator. Uh, don't do this, please. I don't even know what it does. 1 plus 2 and 3 plus 4. And apparently it's storing 7 because the comma operator decided that 3 plus 4 was better than 1 plus 2. I don't know why and I don't care. Really, there's no reason. It probably computes 1 plus 2 and then forgets about it because it also computes 3 plus 4 and this will be the result that will be stored in variable A. But why should I do this? Why should I do a... Uh, a completely useless computation let's just not do it uh, blah 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 okay this is uh, probably more important in loops but we haven't seen loops yet so we're not going to do this and then we've got some tasks so remember the tasks are really important whenever I do these lessons I really encourage you during the rest of the week to read the reference material which is online for free it's javascript.info and you have to read carefully everything because I'm not saying everything and probably uh, the tutorial goes even more thoroughly on uh, or even explains better than I am doing. 
Um, and then you have to do the tasks at the end of each section, which are really, really well done. All these tasks, if you are okay with that, I'm going to do them every Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. I tried last Wednesday at 6.30 a.m., which had almost zero audience, one, audi one person, Bobby. Uh, probably the time was not good. Probably you had other things to do. Uh, I will probably try some other uh, timings. Probably next time I'll try at, uh, I don't know, maybe 8 o'clock, uh, uh, 20, uh, 8 p.m. UTC. And I'll see if there's anybody uh, willing to join. Or you can suggest me what's the best time for you on Wednesday, if, a Wednesday, if Wednesday is a good, uh, a good day for you, of course. Uh, during that uh, practice session, I usually run through the documentation. I do the tasks really slowly. Uh, so if you had problems with the tasks or you got some other results, we can discuss them together. And I will probably come up with some other exercises, just like the exercise that I came up with uh, last Wednesday about the shop. This exercise that we've done this morning together. Uh, we... Yeah, uh, so these are um, tasks that you have to try yourself. How long usually is the practice session? Last time it lasted two hours, but only because I wanted to read carefully every single word of this tutorial. And I did it because I wanted to show you how important it is to read carefully every single word of the tutorial. But if you understood this, if you understood the gist of it, I expect you guys to have read all the source material by Wednesday and maybe even tried some practice. And then we can just move to the tasks uh, part together and we can do the exercises together and that's it. So it can take even less than two hours. It can be one hour and one hour and a half. It depends a lot on what you need. Uh, once we covered all the tasks here, we can jump to free code camp because there are some other exercises that we can do here. Um, I like free code camps exercises too, but what I like more is to do these exercises in real JavaScript files that we can run directly on our Node.js environment or on our browser because it, it, it makes it more real. It's not just code that you type on a website and then you, you just lose it. Okay, so, and it will build your portfolio. We are still doing, putting everything on our inglorious portfolio that we started creating some, uh, some weeks ago. So, please, if you are still struggling with Git and GitHub, please tell me, I can help you put all your exercises, all your practice into your portfolio, which is something that you can show to someone else. Uh, you can see how much you committed. Uh, you can show me, of course, and you can show your potential recruiters out there how much you committed, how much you learned in such a short time. Daily dev is a thing. Uh, I think that uh, you're, taking, you're talking about this. Daily dev is an extension that I installed on Chrome. Uh, it was suggested by a friend of mine, Sohaib. And it's really cool because it has uh, really interesting articles on, uh, on development or on programming. And I think that Daily Dev is also a website. Yeah, programming news ranked by developers. It's really well done. And I decided to keep it. It's completely free. Yep. There's a dog barking outside. I hope it's not distracting you. <laughs> I love dogs. But I would love them to be a little more quiet when I'm doing lesson. Okay, so these are all exercises that I really, really encourage you to do. And I really encourage you to not have a look at the solution before having performed the exercise. Because, of course, once you see the solution, you cannot unsee it. Don't spoil the game to yourselves. Uh, these are all games and you have to see them as games because they, they are fun. You have to find the fun in this. Let's go to some other operators because we have booleans out there and for now you have a personal site. I do have a personal website which is ingloriouscoders.it. Not really that easy to type so if I can just share it with you here. Um, it's a website that describes myself and my activity. I'm a freelance software engineer and I do code and I do lessons paid 
uh, for uh, clients in Italy, in Europe, and also abroad. And uh, luckily, I have good clients and I'm paid enough to want to give back to society and do free courses for everyone. So if uh, anyone out there is struggling in their life, if uh, anyone there uh, doesn't have a job or is and is willing to acquire a new skill and uh, maybe have fun with it and maybe try to be hired for with these new skills, then this is the right place for them. Well, actually, they can everyone can learn these things by themselves. There's a, the online material that I'm showing to you. I didn't create this online material. Uh, it's really, really well done. And if you're, if you're, if you're keen to, you can just uh, uh, learn all these things by yourself. There's a lot of uh, YouTube tutorials. There's courses on Udemy. Udemy. Uh, there's these tutorials here. But if you need more guidance, if you need a live experience, if you need to speak to me, and if you lose motivation and if you need motivation, then I'm here for you. Uh, so in my website, you will see that I do a lot of things. I do code, I speak publicly, I do some volunteering activity, and I consider this thing that I'm doing right now, volunteering activity. And I'm trying also to build a community. I also already have a not really active community on Slack, and I'm starting to build a community on Discord too. I would love you guys to interact one with each other, share doubts, problems, solutions, uh, or even job opportunities one day. Or if someone is lacking a computer, maybe there's someone uh, near that has a spare computer to give for free or something like that. It's just a, a place where, uh, where we can help each other, okay? So... You're a PHP developer, leave you fun. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I, I used to, to, to write some PHP code and uh, it's a good language. I don't want to say it's a bad language. Um, it is a good language. It's a scripting language, just like a JavaScript or Python. It's a dynamically uh, typed language. It's um, um, uh, an interpreted language and it's widely used still nowadays because I think that 80% of uh, the web is created with WordPress or other CMSs, which are made in PHP. So PHP is, is still really, really relevant nowadays. But let's not compare languages. Let's compare variables. So let's go with comparisons. Or is that, or is that already too, too much to, uh, to internalize for you guys? I saw some of you struggling last week because there was so much information to, to process. But uh, if you guys are fine, we can still go on a little bit. Uh, comparisons is just another uh, bit of uh, operators that are applied to, uh, to Booleans. Leave your fun says not really. But <laughs> I don't want to get your feedback on that because you're a PHP developer, so you're probably no already everything here and you're just here for the entertainment which is flattering for me because it means that i'm also entertaining somehow so thanks a lot for sticking with us um but no i'm i'm speaking more to the to the people that never saw any programming languages so far uh, if that's too much for you i can totally understand it and we can probably stop here doing do some more exercises tina says all good I love your way of teaching. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks so very much. Uh, you can copy me, of course. <laughs> uh, this is this has no copyright. So if you want to do something similar uh, to your community or to your switch in your switch you know, Twitch channel, feel free to. Of course, uh, the more people we can uh, we can find and uh, impact, uh, the better. I'm not. I don't want to be the. I don't want to have the monopoly of this. No problems here, says PNTM. Okay, cool. What about uh, Tiago, Sao? Are you there? It's okay from my side as well. Nice, Angelo. Awesome. Yes, I got inspired. Awesome, Leave You Fun. Where are you from, Leave You Fun? Are you an English speaker? I'm Italian, by the way, for those who don't know. Uh, I'm Italian. I Oh, Romania. Nice. Okay, so why not... Uh, Inspire other people in Romania. Everything okay? Thanks, says Tiago. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, everything fine with the exercises too, probably. Yes, it's okay. Nice. 
Perfect. I'm uh, asking Tiago and Sao not because they are the most behind. In fact, they are two of my most committed students. Uh, whenever I asked them to do exercises, they created beautiful exercises. They did their HTML CSS portfolios, which were awesome. Bobby says, baby nearby, but all good. <laughs> okay, I is the baby understanding everything so far? You know, there was the JavaScript for kids. I love this meme. That's it. <laughs> I hope that your baby is not in this situation so far. Yeah, JavaScript can make you cry, but uh, hopefully it will make you smile uh, all the way if I'm good enough in teaching you. Okay, comparison operators. We have comparison, comparison operators on numbers to check if a number is greater than another number or if a number is less than another number. Or we can use the greater than or equals and the... Uh, less than or equals. Let's immediately try some of them. So, will two... What, what is the result of saying two is less than three? Well, these kinds of operators don't give you a number, they give you a boolean, because if you want to check, if, because you want to check if something is true or not. Is two less than three? Yes. Is two less than or equals three? Yes, because 2 is less or equal to 3. Um, is 3 less than or equal to 3? Yes, because it's less. No, it's not less, but it's equal to 3. And is 3 less than 3? No, because it's equal, not less. Okay, so pretty, pretty basic. The pitfall here is that, watch out, you cannot say 2 is equal or less than 3. This is not a valid operator. You see the difference? I have to say less than or equal, not equal or less than. And also you can see that two less than or equal to three can look similar to other operators like this one, which is not correct because I cannot do this on something that is not a variable as we said. So let num is equal to two. If I say num, asterisk equals three, this is a increment operator that gets num and multiplies the num itself by three, so I get six. But num less than equal to three, even though it looks similar, has a completely different meaning. This is just a comparison. Is number less than or equal to three? This is not doing an operation on the number itself and giving the result of that operation, okay? Completely different. And the same goes with the greater than symbol. So if I do 4 is greater than 3, of course, it's true. Is 4 greater than or equal than 3? It is true. I cannot say is 4 equal or greater than 3. This is not a mathematical operator. This is not a comparison operator. This looks like a fat arrow pointing to the 3. So this is not working. And not only it's not working, it says that this is a malformed arrow function parameter list. What? Well, this thing, believe it or not, is actually a keyword. It's actually uh, something that we're going to use, the fat arrow in JavaScript. It exists and has a completely different meaning than the greater than or equal symbol. So don't mess up the order in which you type these characters. Greater than or equal, not equal or greater than, because this is a fat arrow. And then we've got the equals operator. Let's have a look at it. Um, where am I going? Okay, let's go back to this. Uh, by the way, I'm not promoting daily dev. I just have it, a bit, this is my computer. I use it to work every day. So whatever you see here is something that I use. This is VirtualBox, this is MongoDB Compass, Postman, Thunderbird. This is what I usually do, and I'm not promoting everything. I don't have any sponsors. <laughs> I, I don't really care about, right, about it right now. Um, so, let's do an equal comparison. Is two equal to three? Uh, sorry, is two equal to three? No. Is three equal to three? Yes. That's it. 
If you want to say that the, these two are different, they are not equal, you can start using this other operator, is2 different from 3, and as you can see, the difference is with the exclamation mark. Sorry guys, I have uh, calls. <laughs> exclamation mark equals. This means is not true, okay? So 2 is not equal to 3, well, that statement is true which can be kind of confusing, but it's true. Two is not equal to, through, to three, so the statement is true. Three, is it not equal to three? No, it's false, because three is actually equal to three, okay? Uh, if uh, this is strange to you, you can, again, as always, split the problem into multiple variables or into multiple steps. For example, let is three equal to 3 is a variable that is going to hold the result of comparing 3 with itself. Is 3 equal... I'm sorry, I should have done something completely different, exactly the opposite. Uh, so wait a second, I'm gonna get it. Is, equal, is 3 equal to 3 is the result of comparing 3 with itself. Now I'm gonna say, is 3 equal to 3? Yes. Okay, fine. Let is 3 not equal to 3. So this variable will store the results of saying is 3 different from 3? Now I can say is 3 not equal to 3? And it's going to say false. Is 3 not equal to 3? False, because 3 is equal to 3. Maybe if you add this extra variable in between, this makes a little more sense, probably. I don't know. Um, watch out, because I'm starting to use a double equal sign. And as you can understand, the double equal sign is completely different from the single equal sign. The single equal sign is, as a, is an assignment operator. Well, the double equal sign is doing a comparison, okay? So don't mess these up. If you do let num is equal equal to 2, this doesn't work because you want to assign the value 2 to the number, so you have to use just one equal symbol. And if you say is num equal to 4 and you do and you use just one uh, equal symbol, this is not comparing the number with the number 4. This is assigning the value 4 to the number. So I'm not comparing anything. I'm just giving the number a new value. If I want to compare, I have to say number is equal equal to 4. And in that case, it will really compare numbers together. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm checking the chat between the mobile phone and my chat application on desktop. Because sometimes the messages don't show up here on, uh, on phone. Um, let's see... Okay, so the result of these comparisons is always a boolean. So 2 is greater than 1 will give me the boolean value of true. 2 is equal to 1 will give me false. 2 is different from 1 will give me true, because it's correct. Yes, 2, it is actually different from 1. Uh, you can store this result, this boolean result, in a variable. So result is the result of saying 5 is greater than 4, and then I can inspect the value of this variable. I can even compare strings. What does it mean to compare strings? Let's find out. Even before looking at the documentation, let's have a look at what is what does it mean to compare strings. Let's find let's try with the simple strings like uh, a. Is a less than b? Yes, it is. Okay. So, yeah, a comes before b. Um Let's try something else. Uh, is A less than... Uh, or it's, is AA less than AB? True. So the string AA comes before the string AB. Um, is the empty string less than A? Yep, so an empty string comes before A. And now I'm going to start using numbers maybe. Is 1 the string 1 less than the string 2? Yes, yes it is. Okay, 
why is it so? Maybe it converts the string one into a number and then says that one is actually less than number two. This could be a good hypothesis, but let's find out. What if I say, is 11 less than two? True. What? 11 is less than two? No, it should be false because two is a number which is less than 11. But here we're not dealing with numbers, here we're dealing with strings. And strings behave differently. What we are doing here is an alphabetical comparison. And this kind of comparison is the usual comparison that you have in dictionaries, where the word AA comes before the word AB. So we have to treat these strings, these strings not as numbers, but as strings, as words. And the word 1-1 one, one comes before the word 2. Which seems strange, but it's not that strange if you think about the fact that it's exactly the same with characters. AA comes before the letter B. Because in a dictionary, you first have all the words that start with an A, and only after you will see all the words that start with a B. And if in the dictionary you add also numbers, then you will have all the numbers that, starts with, that start with a 1 before having all the numbers that start with a 2. So that's why, alphabetically, 11 comes before 2. Because 11 is a word that starts with 1. And every word that starts with 1 comes before every word that starts with 2. In fact, usually, when I have to name files and I want to keep their order, I usually try to pad these numbers with zeros. So, for example, if I want to keep the 11 as a number greater than 2, I can add a 0 in front of the 2. I can treat the 2 not as a 2, but as a 0 2. 0 2 comes before 11 because every word that starts with a zero will be first and then we'll have all the words that come that start with a one and then all the words that start with a two etc etc so i just need to add an extra zero here and i will have the two being less than 11 alphabetically not only numerically but also alphabetically Okay, so you can compare strings, but the comparison that you do is not a numerical comparison, it's an alphabetical comparison. We can try also, is true less than false? There's nothing going on with booleans here. This is just an alphabetical comparison. True starts with T. False starts with F. And F, usually in the dictionary, is before T. So, true is not less than false. False comes first in the dictionary. You see? Alphabetical comparison. What about negative numbers, says leave you fun? This is an excellent question. Thanks. Let's try. I am going to say minus 1 is less than minus 2. False. Oh, sorry, because I didn't put the minus. Minus 1 is less than minus 2. It's actually true, because these two words start with the same character, the minus, so they are in the same category, but then the second character is on the first side one, on the second side two, and one comes alphabetically before the two. So the minus in this case is still treated exactly like any other character, and if we have two words starting with the same character, then we start looking at the second character, and then the third, the fourth, etc, etc. So this makes a lot of sense alphabetically. Uh, this doesn't really make that sense numerically, because minus 1 is not less than minus 2. Okay, so the capital letter Z is greater than the capital letter A, because alphabetically Z will always be after A. Glow is greater than Glee, because they start with GL, both of them, but the second character, E, is less than the third, the third character, E, uh, is, comes before the third character, O. So, glow is actually alphabetically greater than glee. What about B and B? Or B? <laughs> we have the initial two letters 
which are exactly the same. But then we have the, well, let's say the empty string. And we already saw that the empty strings, string comes before any other string. If I say empty string com is less than A, true. Is empty string coming before space? True. The empty string, I think it comes before pretty much everything else. So, as you can see, B comes before B in the dictionary. So, it's less than uh, B, or B is greater than B. Okay? Uh, there is a difference, I think, between capital and lowercase letters. Let's see. Is A less than capital A? No, actually not. Is it greater than it? Yep. Yeah. Apparently, contrary to common sense, the lowercase a is greater than the uppercase a. Why is that? The lowercase is smaller in size. But this is not related to size. This is related to the character map. So let's see if I can find something useful here. Yep. Okay. Uh, you... I don't know if you ever saw this kind of maps here. Uh, you should find it on, on your computer too. I think I have... I can say... Yeah, characters. Okay. <laughs> it starts with smileys. I think this minus one is about a special number comparison. Special number comparison? No, I don't think so. Um, I think we pretty much proved that the dash is just treated as a... As this, uh, as a character, like oh, like oh, okay, special character in that sense, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the dash, the the minus, it's just a special character, and the, the special character can be something like yeah, the at symbol or the tilde symbol. If they are both tilde symbol, they uh, they come exactly uh, one next to the other. They are in the same category of words starting with a tilde, and then. In this category, the tilde one will still start, uh, will still be before, uh, located before the tilde two. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you at first. Yes, exactly. Um, it's a it's a special character. It's not it's it's not just they are not treated like uh, mathematical operators. It's not about numbers. It's just about characters. So uh, I have a character map in my, on my computer. I can just go with letters and symbols, and I can see that there are punctuation, arrows, bullets. This is a character map. And in my character map, for example, if I go to the category letters, I see that the capital letters are listed before the lowercase letters. And the, le the lowercase letters are listed before any special letter, like these ones here. And it should be exactly the same with your character map on your computer, whatever computer you have. We also have uh, lots of different languages here. We've got Cyrillic, we've got... Uh, I don't even know the, the, the name sometimes. Oh, we have also Roman literals, etc, etc. So, a character map is a mapping between the different characters that we can use on our computer and their representation on the computer. You know that computer only deals with uh, binary numbers. Uh, binary numbers can be converted into decimal numbers, but you cannot just store a character in the computer. The character should be converted into a number, a code that represents that number, and stored maybe as a binary number. So for example, the A, you see this pop-up here showing, the A has a decimal code of 65. So, if I ask the computer, hey, give me the character with a code 65, it will give me an A, a capital A. And if I go to the lowercase a, it has another decimal code, it has 97. So, how do, we, how do you achieve alphabetical comparisons on computers? So, the plus comes before minus, says leave you fun. Probably yes. Let's see where the plus is. This is the plus, which is 43. And the minus is two steps uh, f uh, on the right, 45. Yes, so apparently the plus symbol comes before the minus. And if I try, is plus one 
my, less than minus one? Yes, it is true, because this word plus one comes in the dictionary before the minus one. And now you understand what it also means to what it also means to uh, come before in the dictionary. This is the dictionary of computers. Every single character has a special code. The code which is 52 for the number 4, 51 for the number 3, and the comparison that is done under the hood by the computer is just to see if the decimal code of one character is less than the decimal code of another character. So, the capital A comes before the lowercase a because its code 65 is lower than the code 97. And that's it. That is cool, says Leave You Fun. Yes, it is. I love these things. Okay, so we now know what happens under the hood when doing the alphabetical comparison. Not really that relevant for, for our cases, but it's a curious thing. And, uh, okay, but what if we want to compare different types? This is where things get a little tricky. So, you know that you can do operations on things that have different types, because JavaScript is weakly typed. So, as much as I can do a 1 plus string 1, and it will get into a concatenation, I can also do a comparison between 1 and 1. And what happens here is that it gives me false. Why is it giving me false? Well, the comparison operator, as, as, as we saw, can be performed between two numbers or between two strings. And here I'm comparing numbers with strings. So what I'm asking myself is, is this thing going to compare two numbers? So converting this string into a number and then comparing the number one with the number one? Or is it doing a comparison between two strings. So it's going to convert the number into a string and then compare the two strings alphabetically. This is the question that I'm posing myself and instead of looking at documentation, I want to perform experiments in order to find out by myself, which is more fun, I think. So, for example, let's see, is two less than the number one? False. Well, of course, because if they are two numbers, two is not less than the number one. And if they are two strings, they are not still alphabetically uh, in order. So this experiment that I performed is actually just trying to confirm what I am suspecting and not giving me new any information. I have to find some other experiments that will give me the result that I need. So for example, is 2 less than 11 string? Okay, so let's think about it. If this was a string and this was a string, it will be false. Instead, if this was a number and the other one was a number, it will be true. So if this comparison is true, is giving me true, the comparison is being performed between two numbers. Because only uh, transforming this 11 into the number 11 will give me this result of true. If instead JavaScript was automatically converting the number 2 into a string 2, it will give me false. So LiviaFont says 2 is greater than the number uh, the, the string 1. This is another experiment that we can do. Is 2 greater than the number 1? Uh, yes, it is. But what if are they are both strings? Same. And what if they are both numbers? Same. So uh, this experiment is not giving me the new information that I needed. This is just proving that the greater than comparison is working with strings and with numbers. And incidentally, right now, it is giving me the same results because in this case, the numerical ordering is exactly the same as the alphabetical ordering. But this other experiment that I came up with is trying to force the fact that the numerical order is different from the alphabetical order. So if I compare these two, either they compare numerically and this will give me a result, or they compare alphabetically and this will give me a different result.
So with this experiment, I am now pretty sure, pretty confident that the comparison here is performed between the two numbers because this is the same result. So the comparison operator between a number and a string is not doing like the plus symbol. It's not converting the number to a string. It's actually doing exactly the opposite. It's converting the number, uh, the string into a number. Livio Fan says, but if two is less than string one is false, then two greater than string one is true. So then we know. Not really sure about that. Let's let's say it together. Uh, let's say it again. Uh, okay, um, fresh fresh console. So we said that two greater than one is false. Now I'm going to say that two greater than one is true. In here, I'm just negating what I said before. I'm just saying that if a statement is true, then the opposite of the statement must be false and vice versa. This is not giving me much information. This is not what I was looking for. I was looking for another kind of information. I want to know if uh, the comparison operator between two uh, quantities of, the, of a different type, so string and number, will convert one of the quantities into a string or into a number or vice versa, okay? But, Livio Fun says, uh, yes, I get it. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so it, this will be exactly the same as saying, is one less than two? Yes. So this means that one is not greater than two. Yeah, one is not greater than two. This doesn't give me that much information about what I was looking for. This just gave me the information that if one is less than two, then one is not greater than two. Actually, one is not even equal to two. So it's just less than two. Okay, so we can compare things together. And apparently, this is a numerical comparison. And it says it here too. String two will become a number. We will become the number two. And in fact, two is greater than one. And if I say zero one, apparently this string zero one is still a numerical comparison because the string zero one will become a number one. This is something that we never experimented before. Will a number zero one? Oh, number zero one becomes one. So even if I put padding, zero padding, it's still going to be converted into the number one. So I can do comparisons. So zero one is actually less than two. That's fine. Or uh, zero two, is it less than one? No, because alphabetically, maybe it is true because any word that starts with a zero will still come before any word that starts with a one. But if one of the two is a number, then this becomes a numerical comparison. The zero two is automatically converted to a number, the number two by JavaScript, and two is not less than one. This happens with weakly typed languages such as JavaScript. I don't know actually any other weakly typed language, but there must be somewhere uh, another weakly typed language. I can even compare booleans and numbers and I can finally show that true is numerically equivalent to one and false is numerically equivalent to zero. I can even say that true is greater than zero. I cannot say that true is less than zero because, well, true is one, so it is not less than zero. Liu Yufan says, if it contains letters, it will strip them out and get only the numbers um, are you talking about the number function here? We proved that, no, num the number function, this number constructor, if we want to use the proper, the proper term, is uh, a lot less resilient than the parse int and the parse float function. If you use parse int, you do one, two, three, and then anything else, and it will just use one, two, three. Every digit that it finds will become the number. But if you do the same with number, it's going to say, no, this is not a number for me. You have to give me a number. Whatever number, even with spaces, but no other extra strange characters. You can even use dots in order to have a floating point. And now I understood that you can probably even put a zero padding here, or even a zero padding there, and it will still look like a number. 
but uh, no strange characters before or after. So we're looking at comparisons. So true is equal to one and false is equal to zero when doing this. A funny consequence, let's see this. It is possible that at, the same, that at the same time two values are equal and one of them is true as a boolean and the other one is false as a boolean. What? Let's see. Let a is equal to the number zero. If I now convert it into boolean, zero becomes false. Let b is equal to the string zero. And as you know, the boolean function takes whatever string and if it's an empty string, it's false. If it's a non-empty string, even if it contains a zero or a space, it will, it will be true. So, boolean of b is still true. And then, now that you have a false value and a true value, you can compare them and a is equal to b. What? Why is it, what, how is it possible? Well, uh, the trick is that it, the weak typing of JavaScript is saying that if I do zero, is equal to zero, these are actually true. Let's try to make sense of this. Well, it's pretty easy. The comparison operator, if you apply it between a number and a string, is going to convert the string into a number. So number of the string zero is going to give me zero. So this means that zero is equal to zero, and that's true. In this code here, they tried to make us think that these numbers represent two different values, but it's not. Um, boolean of zero is false. Boolean of string zero is true. And if I compare the Boolean values of these two, they are actually not equal because transforming the number zero and the string zero into booleans gives me two different boolean values but as i said before if you compare the string zero and the number zero i'm not actually converting anything into boolean i'm converting into numbers and numbers behave this differently because st the string zero becomes converted into the number zero and then I'm comparing just zero with zero. I'm comparing the two numbers and they are equal. The problem here is that the string zero, even though it's converted into the number zero, but when you convert it into boolean, it's not false, it's true. And that's the reason why converting to boolean yields a different result than comparing two numbers. Because any char is a boolean true. Exactly, yeah. Any character here, any character uh, is going to give you true. Unlike the empty string. The empty string is going to give you false. Whatever else is going to give you true. Even one, a thousand, minus one. So there is a slight difference that we already witnessed today between numbers and booleans. I see a lot of light coming out. Am I... Yep, yeah, I'm... Uh, I look like a saint. I'm going uh, to switch off one light. Let's see if it goes better. Oops. Is it doing any better? Yeah, almost. There's still too much light, which is kind of cool. Better to have light than, than darkness, at least uh, in here. Uh, at least when we're stuck at home. Okay, so I think that you got this. But there's one thing more. I'm sorry for that. There's a strict equality operator, which makes a lot of sense. In fact, from now on, I'm going to discourage you, almost always, to use equals equals as an operator. Because the fact that JavaScript has this uh, weakly typed uh, system can be cool, can be good, you can use it at your advantage, but, well... Mostly it's confusing. You don't want to mix two different types together. You don't want to mix this kind of mixture. Also, because this kind of mixture with numbers yields a different result from when you treat these uh, two types as booleans. So you want to do a comparison between two quantities that have the same type. And if they don't have the same type, then they are not equal. 
And this is where the strict equality operator uh, comes into place. So zero as a string is equal to zero as a number because under the hood, the string zero is automatically converted into a number. I don't want this automatic conversion anymore. I want to say that zero, since it has a different type from the number zero, is not equal to zero. The strict equality operator is done with the triple H, which is also a wrestler, triple H. But in this case, uh, there's no wrestling. Uh, here, the strict equality operator, which is performed with this triple, uh, triple equals. Why did I say triple H? Triple equals. <laughs> oh my God, my, my, my mind is, uh, is, is, is tricking me now. Triple equals symbol triple equals character, does the strict equality comparison. And the strict equality comparison behaves like the equality comparison, but does one test first. It first checks if the two values have the same type. If they don't have the same type, no, they're not equal. But if they have the same type, then it's going to do the comparison. So the string zero is not equal to the number zero because they don't have the same type. But the number zero is equal to the number zero, as much as false is equal to false, or a one is equal to one, or the string one is equal to the string one. Okay? Did you understand this? It's a pretty identical comparison, says Liu Yufan. I don't want to use this term for now. Uh, you're probably correct. Yeah, it, it looks like they are exactly the same thing. But since you are already a developer, you probably know that as soon as we deal with objects, we have to talk about references. So in that case, we cannot uh, talk about identity. They are not exactly the same thing, but they could refer to the same thing. So let's say that, yeah, they are strictly equal in, in the sense that they have the same type and given the fact that they have the same type, they also have the same, they hold the same value, okay? And we can try string stuff like, uh, is none equal to none? No, not even strictly. No, if they're not equal, they're not even strictly equal. Is infinity equal to infinity? True. And are they of the same type? Yes, we know that they are the same type, so they're both infinity. Um, what else? Is null equal to null? True, but with strict equality? Also true. Is undefined equal to, to, to undefined? True, and this goes also with strict equality. Oops. And now the strange thing, if I remember correctly, is undefined equal to null? True, but with strict equality says no. What is happening here? Well, if you're using the, 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 the more relaxed equality operator, undefined will be equal to null because probably one of the two will be uh, converted into the other. So undefined will probably be converted into null or null will be converted to undefined. Actually, I don't know which one is which. I probably believe that undefined will be converted to null. But if you want to have a proof, just find a proof for me as an exercise, for uh, as a homework. Uh, but strict equality tells me that undefined is not the same as null, which is kind of cool. But this comparison here is something that we can use at our advantage. For example, if we have a variable let A, this variable that I just declared has no value. So its value will be undefined, I think. Type of A is undefined. Is A equal to undefined? Yes, it is. Is A strictly equal to undefined? Yes, it is. Is A strictly equal to null? No, it is undefined. But uh, is A equal, not strictly, to null? Yes, because we saw that comparing null with undefined, not strictly, will still give me true. And this is exactly the only uh, occasion in which is, it is usually uh, suggested to use just the double equals. If you want to check if a variable is null or undefined, you can say, is A equal equal to null? 
because if you say a is equal equal to null, this will give you true if a is equal strictly too many equals to undefined and it is true also if it's strictly equal to null. So if you don't care if the variable is undefined or null, if you want to see if the variable is undefined or null, then in that case you can use a equal equal to null and you catch both situations. You don't need to say both of them. Uh, so this is the only place where I usually accept and not only I and only myself, you, you will see that there are some standard coding rules that we can follow and we, will, uh, we are already following them uh, in which the equal equal sign is accepted. If you want to compare to null, usually you prefer to compare with the less strict equals operator because this strict, less strict equal operator catches both situations, both comparisons, equal undefined or equal null. But for every other case, it is much better if you use the strict equality operator because you always want to compare quantities that have the same type. You don't want to mix apples with oranges. You want to mix strings with numbers. You just want to compare strings or numbers together. Okay? So strict equality is what we're going to use always from now on to check uh, the equality of two quantities apart from when we compare with null. And okay, this is also uh, stated in the, in the tutorial. I didn't know it. I don't usually read the whole tutorial. Uh, but yeah, apparently it also says exactly what I've said here. Null is not strictly equal to undefined, but it's non-strictly equal to undefined. So we usually prefer to use null, uh, comparison to null with the double equals. Uh, what if you use nulls and undefined with these operators here? Apparently null becomes zero and, be and undefined becomes not a number. So there is a difference between null and, uh, un and undefined apparently. Is null greater, greater or equal than zero? Yes, because apparently null becomes zero. Is undefined greater than or equal than zero? No, because undefined becomes none. How do I know this? Well, because we know that these comparisons are performed on numbers, so probably under the hood the null number will be converted to zero and the undefined will be converted to whatever number of undefined says, which is none, not a number. Libufan says, can two different objects be that have the same data be objects uh, not equal to object two? You're talking about objects and uh, we are going to talk about objects, but for now I'm not going to reply to you. I'm sorry if this is rude, but uh, we will tell, uh, I will tell you this as soon as we start dealing with objects. I don't want to, uh, to, to mess with, uh, with the students that have no idea what an object is. Um, I can say that uh, when you deal with objects, it's, it has to deal with references. So the equal symbol is exactly the same with uh, references. They must be two references to the same object, not two equal objects. I hope that you got the hint and that everybody else is not confused by what I just said. Um, but Liu Yu Fun uh, added a really important thing. Just like you can have zero equal 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 zero for uh, for equal comparison, you can have one different equal equal to zero for strict inequality, okay? You just use the exclamation mark at the start. And of course, this is true, but this checks for the type. So, okay, this is also true, <laughs> of course. And uh, this instead is false, okay? As always. Um, Wait a second, I had to do this. Uh... Okay, this is what I wanted. One is different from one because the two types are different. But in a non-strict kind of way, the string one is not equal from is, is not equal from one, is actually different from one. 
um, is not actually different from Olga. I'm got, I'm got it puzz puzzled a little bit. Uh, the string is equal to the number in non-strict equality. So this is giving me false. It's pretty difficult to say. It's even more difficult than the um, tongue twister that I used to say a couple of lessons ago. Sorry, it might be a dumb question, but when would you use the non-equality over non-equality not strict or not e equality over equality? So JavaScript, when it was created, it allowed to do equality and strict equality. And it gave you the choice to what to use. For example, equality could be used to do something like let result is equal to prompt guess a number. And then I want to check if the result is equal to 10. There's no problem with this code. In fact, if the user guesses a number, the user will input uh, a number. It seems like a number, but it's actually a string. You remember that prompt actually returns a string. And if I do this kind of comparison, uh, the comparison will automatically uh, convert the string result into a number, and I can do this comparison. So enter, guess a number, 10, and it's going to give me true because the result, even if it's a string, I can say, what is result? Result is a string, it's a string 10. But in with this non-strict equality operator, I can not care about converting the string into a number, just like we did with the, the um, uh, multiplication operator, if you remember. But uh, we don't like this kind of uh, conversion made under the hood. We want the conversion to be explicit. So instead of doing this comparison, I want to see, I want to say that uh, I will create a new variable, let num result is the conversion of results into a number. So now num result is actually a number. And now I want to do a strict comparison between num result and 10. And this is just giving me more control. There's nothing magic happening under the hood. I know for sure that I had a string, and if I, even if I didn't have a string, this function is going to convert whatever the result was into a number. And then I can compare two numbers knowing that they are two numbers, okay? So, bottom line, always use the strict equal operator, the three equals, and not the the, the non-strict operator. The only, uh, the only occasion in which we usually accept the double equal instead of triple equal is when you want to check for null. If you want to see if num result is null or undefined, you just say equal equal null and it will say if this num result is equal to null or is equal to undefined, which usually is pretty much the same. I'm telling you that null means no value and undefined means I don't know the value, but sometimes or probably most often they are treated exactly the same. It means I don't know and I don't care. Okay, you got it, awesome. So strange results. Uh, okay, uh, it's, it's interesting to have a look at this code. Let's see, null, is it greater than zero? Probably not, because null in this case is converted into the number zero, and zero is not greater than zero, so it's false. Is null equal to zero? It says false. I would have said true. Why is null equal equal to zero? Let's see. So null, is it equal to zero? False. We already said that number null is zero. So if this was, um, Leviathan says different type, but I'm not checking for strict equality. You see that this is just an equals equals, not strict equality. So there is some conversion happening under the hood. And apparently when you use the equals equals, it's not a conversion to number because if this null was converted to a number, then null will become zero and this will be zero is equal to zero, which is true. But since null is equal equal to zero gives me false, something else is happening. And uh, let's see what they say about it. The two says, 
The equality check for undefined and null is defined such that without any conversions, they equal each other and don't equal anything else. That's why null is equal to zero is false. So apparently null will always be equal to itself or to undefined, but not to anything else. Not even strictly. Strictly, it's even worse. Null is never will never be equal to zero strictly. It will all be only be equal to itself, probably. Yes, because they have the same type. And will not even be equal to undefined because they have different types. So yeah, apparently there is this other strange thing that null is not equal, not even strictly, to zero. But if you compare them then in that case something strange happens greater than or equal to zero that is true because with greater than or equal in that case this is obviously a mathematical operator so null will be converted to zero and this comparison will be true i'm showing you some quirks on javascript and if you are curious there is a watts video that I really encourage you to see after this lesson. It's really, really fun. And it shows you a lot of quirks, not only on JavaScript, but on uh, in different programming languages, if I remember correctly. I'm going to share this, um, this link with you. You know what? I'm going to put it on Discord too. So you're forced to use Discord. Well, you're not. Um, I'm going to put it in lulls because it's uh, quite lulling, but it's also pretty interesting to, to, to understand. And I think that probably you will also see this joke here, the na 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 Batman. Okay, so we're looking at comparisons and it's really, really nuts. Null, is it greater than zero? False, because in this case, the greater than symbol uh, operator converts null into a number so zero is not greater than zero the same goes with this third one the greater than or equals operator converts null into a number in the, the number zero and zero is actually greater than or equals to zero but if you do this uh, not even strict comparison between null and zero in that case well null is compared only with itself or with undefined, and it will only be tr equal to itself or undefined. So it will not be equal to the number zero. Really, really strange. Uh, undefined, apparently, is not comparable with anything. Undefined is not greater than zero, is not less than zero, and it's not even equal to zero. Okay, you know what, these things, uh, I must assure you, you don't have to learn them by heart. I'm learning them for the first time with you guys. And tomorrow, I will already have them unlearned because I don't need them. I don't need to remember all of this. We, the only thing that you have to get from this lesson is play, play with the information that you have because this is the only way that you can make this thing, well, not boring. <laughs> and this is a way that you can really internalize the concepts and make, it, and make them yours and, uh, and start getting uh, confident with this language, okay? Avoid problems. Why did we go over these examples? Should we remember these peculiarities all the time? Well, not really. Actually, these tricky things will gradually become familiar over time, but there's a solid way to avoid problems with them. Treat any comparison with undefined null except the street equality with exceptional care. Don't use comparisons with a variable which may be null or undefined unless you're really sure of what you're doing. If a variable can have these values, check for them separately. I think that this tutorial is pretty much saying exactly what I did so far. You don't need to know all these things by heart. Just watch out. Don't compare apples with oranges. Try to compare only uh, the same types and try to use strict equality operator always. Except maybe if you're using undefined and null. In that case, I usually use uh, the, the non-strict equality operator. This is a summary. These are the tasks that you have to do. And now we're going to have a look at some more complex things. So I'm going to stop here for now, I think, because um, I don't want to put too much meat 
in the oven. I don't know if you can say that. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, translate uh, from Italian. Uh, so I'm not going to go with conditional branching. I'm stopping here. There are probably other operators to do, uh, but for now we'll stick with uh, these comparisons operator. Uh, remember, for next time, which can be next Wednesday if you want to join the practice session or for next Saturday for the last lesson, please read all this reference material. Please play just like I played uh, together with you guys uh, with the code. Make mistakes, share these mistakes with everybody else on the chat. Uh, try to fix those mistakes by yourselves. Try to get help from me or from other people in the community. And do these exercises, just fi only find the solution if you really understood and if you really got everything, otherwise you will not unsee the solution. If the exercises are uh, not enough for you, you can jump to Free Code Camp and have a look at the exercises that we can find here. So I was looking at the basic JavaScript here and up till last time we could do up till uh, divide one number, but now we know how to increment a number with JavaScript, how to decrement a number. You can probably see the create decimal numbers, multiply two decimals, divide one decimal by another, finding a remainder in JavaScript, compound assignment, these are all uh, exercises that you can do, declare string variables, these are all exercises that you can do. I think that you can go to maybe appending variables to strings because finding the length of a string I never showed it to you. Um, probably there are also other exercises that you can do but probably you can you can just do the exercises up to appending variables to strings. There's also Livio Fanz that says null is equals equal to zero is like you are the first man after the snowman. <laughs> That's true. Kind of, uh, kind of strange, yeah. Um, so if you want to do exercises on Free Code Camp, do all you can do from the basic JavaScript up to, as I said, to what was that? Oh, there's also escaping. Uh, to up to appending, appending variables to strings. Uh, this is the last one. Do not find the length of a string because we didn't do it together. Then, if it's not enough, you can come up with your own exercises. And if you cannot come up with your own exercises, this Discord is a little place where you can say, hey, I've finished all the exercises. Please give me something else to do. And I will come up with some more exercises. Uh, maybe something that will mix alerting, prompting, confirming, just like the shop application that we've done together, okay? So, so many things to do in the meantime. Please do your homework before following the other lessons because the more we go, the more it will be difficult for you if you don't internalize the concepts. We are going to start next time with uh, conditional operators, logical operators, uh, knowledge coalescence and then this is the second boss of our game the first boss was probably git this is the second boss I saw many people struggle with this concept not because the concept is difficult per se but this concept will allow us to create real complex programs that actually do something and uh, it's here we're starting to create some uh, so, something logical. So the cool thing about the JavaScript language is that you can learn it as any other language by uh, learning the words, learning the rules, the grammar, and even start speaking some simple sentences like we are doing right now. And the cool thing about JavaScript is not that it's it's actually like learning Romanian or Indonesian or Italian. You don't need to really learn a new language. It is a language based on English. But the drawback of this is that it's a, it's a powerful language that allows you to express complex concepts, logical concepts, mathematical concepts, and it will allow the computer to execute your orders. And you have to be careful on what orders you give to your computer because your computer could uh, do something really strange. For example, like in this, uh, like in this uh, uh, comic strip, 
that you probably don't understand the whole code, but probably now you already know what is the, the reason why this strip should be fun. Oh no, the robots are killing us! But why? We never programmed them to do this! Well, if you look at this code, it says, if is crazy murdering robot is equal to true, kill humans. The problem here is that an assignment operator was used instead of a comparison operator. So it was testing if the robot was a crazy murdering robot, but it's not comparing, it's assigning the value to true. So it's going to kill humans. We're not going to write code that is going to kill humans, but this is one of the pitfalls in which programmers usually fall. Uh, you type a wrong command, a wrong expression, and what you say is completely different from what you mean. So we have to be extra careful. And uh, we're going to be careful, don't worry. But you have to practice in order to uh, improve your carefulness, if we can say it. That's it for today. I think we can start, uh, we can end a little shorter, unless you have anything to ask me, uh, any doubts, any feedbacks. Otherwise, I'm going to say you goodbye. And thanks a lot for sticking with me. Give you a little bit of time. Thanks for the session, says PNTM. A stream mentioning COFIF and Triple H is never a bad one. <laughs> glad, you, uh, glad you appreciated the references. Okay, so thanks a lot, guys. And see you next Wednesday or next Saturday. In the meantime, remember to eat pasta, code faster. Look how gloomy I am. Bye.